Okay. Uh, good morning uh, and welcome to the 31st meeting in 2017 of the Finance and Constitution Committee. Can I ask colleagues to remember to put their mobile phones on silent? Um, the first item on our agenda is to take evidence on the Scottish Government's draft budget for 2018-19. We're joined for this item by Lady Susan Rice, the Chair of the Scottish Fiscal Commission, by video conference, and by John Ireland, the Chief Executive, Professor Alistair Smith, who's a Commissioner, and David Wilson, who's a Commissioner. I welcome all of our guests in meeting and I invite Lady Rice to make a brief opening statement. Lady Rice, over to you. Convener, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to make a short opening statement, an even shorter closing statement, and then uh, say something about our forecast in between. Uh, let me thank you for inviting the Commission to give evidence today uh, on our uh, forecast report, which we published last What do we do in these circumstances? I'm just going to suspend just for two or three minutes, please, folks. Can you still hear me, Lady Rice? No. Okay, I'm suspended just for a minute. That's one. Can you hear me, Lady Rice? Good morning, colleagues. Uh, we, we reconvene. Uh, um, unfortunately, we've lost the signal to, to Lady Rice, and in these circumstances, uh, we, we don't have time to, unfortunately, to, to try to reconnect. Um, it's quite an important session this morning, but I'm glad to say that David Wilson, one of the commissioners, uh, is ready with the opening statement. So, David, can we go to you, please? Thank you, and good morning, everyone. Um, I, I have a note of what Lady Rice say, would have said to you, um, and just to go through um, some introductory remarks uh, before going into the session proper. 
Um, so thank you for the opportunity to, for, for this session to discuss our report published uh, last uh, Thursday. Um, this is an important milestone for us as the Scottish Fiscal Commission. It's our first set of forecasts uh, as, a, as an independent and statutory body. Um, we've been set up to provide the independent official forecast to inform the Scottish Budget following the devolution of powers to the Scottish Parliament in the Scotland Acts 2012-2016. Uh, uh, we're one of a growing number of independent fiscal institutions uh, worldwide, uh, most, most prominently, prominently obviously in the UK is the Office of Bu Budget Responsibility with whom we work uh, closely and who I believe you're, you're seeing early in January. So our forecasts play an important role in the Scottish Budget, which was published uh, on Thursday alongside um, our report. Um, the OBR's forecasts are also an important part of that, and they, they make the official forecasts for UK government tax receipts, which are an important part of the calculation of the block grant adjustment. Um, as part of our pro process of, of ways of working, of developing a report, we've been working collaboratively with the OBR and a number of um, other organisations, UK government organisations, and with the Scottish Government to develop uh, a report. And we've been doing that on the basis of our protocol with the Scottish Government and a number of um, memoranda of understanding that we have with other organisations, including the, the OBR, um, uh, uh, and we work with other bodies like the HMRC. So over the last 10 weeks or so, we've been developing our forecasts and we provided uh, in, in, in good time ahead of the, the, the government finalising it, it, its budget, we provided the, the final um, assessment of our forecasts um, and we also provided on the basis of information that the government provided to us uh, our assessment of the, the costings of the new policy proposals that were announced uh, by the government uh, last Thursday. All of the detail on both our forecasts and the policy costings are set out uh, in, in our report. Um, Broadly speaking, and I think by now you will have, have seen and digested the broad numbers that we, we, we set out, um, perhaps the, the key points, just in, in summary, we made forecasts of um, around £16 billion worth of um, the devolved taxes, um, mo most prominent within that on income tax, and we also made for the first time a set of formal independent um, forecasts of the, the, the Scottish economy. Um, we described the economy forecasts as painting a picture of subdued growth going forward over the, f the five uh, year period. Um, and we hope we've set out a, a quite detailed level of information to understand and, and develop um, the, the wider discussion on the, those points. Prominent among the policy costings was the detailed costing about the income tax change that was an announced by, by the government uh, involving the, the change, proposed changes in um, income tax. And we've provided detailed assessment both the, of the costings and uh, importantly, the uh, ch potential changes in uh, behavioural um, impact of those policies and how that might, might in turn impact on the, the collection of, of receipts. Um, we've also set out our uh, estimates of expenditure on the, um, the devolved social security expenditures that have already been devolved, uh, and we're developing our capability to make further um, estimates of expenditure of the further powers that uh, are likely to be devolved uh, going forward. Uh, so that, that's the overall um, report. Uh, we're delighted to offer uh, more detailed uh, answers to any particular questions that you have. Well, thank you very much for that, David. There are a couple of areas I just want to get uh, questions I want to ask myself to get some of the, the numbers on the record and some of the explanation on the record. One relates to um, tax revenues, the others to, to gross figures and the fact that actually the Scottish budget seems to be £366 million pounds better off. We'll come to that one. Um, but first of all, Table 3.9 in your report includes a forecast of a loss of £51 million in tax revenues for 2018-19 due to behavioural changes out of a total forecast of £215 million for the Scottish Government's proposed tax policy. Can you provide a breakdown, please, of how you arrive at that figure of £51 million? I know it's probably available in your fuller report, but I think it would be useful for record purposes if you could provide that breakdown. I think the main thing to say about the breakdown of the behavioural response is that almost all of the behavioural response happens up at the 
top end of the of the income scale. That's the the so, so uh, I, John, maybe you have a table to hand, but yeah. but. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the main impact is set out in Annex um, A, which is the, the more detailed assessment of the, the po policy costing of the, the change in income tax. So the, the, way, that, the way that we d develop this is to produce what we call a static costing. This is the costing of the proposal without any behavioural impact. It assumes that people would, uh, you know, uh, uh, basically their tax liabilities would, would stay the same uh, or the, the amount they work and the amount that is, is declared would be, would be broadly similar and then the, the new tax rate would apply to, to that, that same amount. The, the detail of that broken down by the new five-band approach is in Table A6, which is on page 194 of the report, um, and the, the following table, Table A7 on the on following page, sets out how that would uh, break down, um, how the, the behavioural effect would be broken down by the, the, the tax rate. I think, as, as Alistair has said, the overwhelming majority of the impact of um, the, the behavioural impact would be in the top two groupings of the higher rate and the top rate, and that, that's, that's set out, in, as I say, in Table A7. Take the, the, the top rate example, because the static rate, as you talked about, is set at 53 million potential and... Um, improvement in terms of tax take, but, are, but are then, then again reduced by minus 31 million as a result of um, behavioural issues. Is, can, you, can you explain about how you, you came to these numbers? Yes, perhaps I, I, I could do that. Um, what we've done here um, to, to calculate that 31 um, million reduction at the, the top rate is we've um, developed um, some what we call taxable income elasticities, but basically um, a factor which allows us to, to, to look at the impact of the changing um, rate, tax rates upon those top rate payers. Um, that, that, that sort of factor is, is basically taken from a series of studies at the UK level, um, at, which were done by HMRC um, and have been looked at by the IFS um, and they, they have produced a range of, of, of factors. Um, our factors are very much towards the top end of that, that, scale, that range. Um, the reason for that is that the HMRC IFS numbers were calculated in response to the change of a UK-wide UK -wide change in the, um, what is, in a sense, the top rate. Um, but we're very, very much conscious that if that, behavior, if that change just happens in Scotland, the opportunity for people to rearrange their affairs between Scotland and the rest of the UK is, is much stronger. So that's why we've gone for something at the top end of that sort of range. That would suggest from the numbers that if the... And I, I know you, and you probably haven't done these numbers. If for, for instance, if it was 47p rate... Sorry, 47% rate, that we're getting pretty... It would be getting close to a situation where if these numbers are correct, even though at the top end, that actually you would begin to be in a negative situation as far as the tax take when top rate tax players were concerned. Am I right? Well, we, we've, only, um, we've only looked at the actual proposal that the government has yeah. made, which is a one p change in that rate. Yeah. Um, you, because in a sense, that's all we're allowed to do by our remit. So we can't, yeah. we can't talk about those alternative policies. OK. Um, I ask the question. Sorry, if there was a two, so I understand that, but if there were a 2p change in the top rate rather than a 1p change in the top rate, would the behavioural change be likely to be double, or would it be? I mean, we just, we, we have no idea how these numbers are, are, are calculated. So well, be, you, you'd, you'd expect both numbers to grow, that the, 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 the static revenue raised from a higher, from a 2p rate rather than a 1p rate would be higher, and the behavioural effects would be, would be higher, but... As John said, we haven't done any analysis, but there's no reason to suppose that, that the behavioural effect is going to grow faster than the direct revenue effect. So it wouldn't necessarily turn negative. And I think there's one more thing to, to add here, is that right. our modelling um, has allowed us to think about forestalling effects as well. Um, and we judged that for the, 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 the rise that the government has, has, has decided upon, that there were um, no no real measurable forestalling effects, but obviously for larger tax rate changes there, there may well be those forestalling effects which will have an effect upon the estimates as well. And we make that clear in the report. Okay, thank you. 
Does anyone want, else want to ask issues around the 51%, so the £51 million pound figure? I asked, did you have some in that, or have I used all your question up? I think you've covered it, yeah. OK. Patrick? Thank you very much. Good morning. Um, you acknowledge at one paragraph, just below the, the tables on this, uh, the key uncertainty in the costing is the taxpayer behavioural response. Uh, so we're, we're looking at a guesstimate. We're looking at, at something which is a, a, a significant area of uncertainty. Uh, would you say that you've erred on the side of caution? You're right that this is an estimate. Uh, as John explained, it's, it's based on... Uh, quite a body of work that has been done by HMRC and others. Nevertheless, it, it is an estimate. But no, we haven't erred on... Uh, I don't think we've aimed to err on the side of caution. We've aimed to give our best estimate. That's our job. I mean, the, the consequences of... Um, um, no, no one would expect you have a, a, a crystal ball and can predict with 100% certainty. So there's, there's naturally going to be some uncertainty. But the consequences of a significant variation between this prediction and what actually happens uh, are not just financial. They're political as well. They could profoundly affect the, the nature of the debate at the next Scottish Parliament election, for example, if the Scottish Government at that time has to deal with significantly less money available because the behavioural effects were underestimated or significantly more money available because the behavioural effects were overestimated. Have you thought about how to minimise the political risks uh, of, that kind of um, that kind of uncertainty? I think our aim has been to try to develop the most robust estimate that we can, recognising the very significant uncertainty about this. There was a um, I think a very important report that was undertaken by the HMRC evaluating the experience of the, the increase in the, uh, the top tax rate um, in 2010 by the UK government. And in that case, on the basis of actual data and evidence of a, a you know, real life experience, it was still found that uh, you know, the uncertainty on the, the overall effects of behavioural change are still very difficult to, to, to assess. So I mean, just think repeating what my colleagues have said, we've tried to make an estimate which draws on the best available um, uh, information and analysis that's been done, recognising that we're in a, a new territory here. Uh, we don't have... Uh, accumulated experience of how um, differences may, may play out when, when people within a single nation state could potentially um, adjust their tax affairs between being a Scottish taxpayer and, and a UK taxpayer. So I think we've, we've, we've made an informed judgment and we've set out all of the, the, the details in, in full um, on that. The, there are, of course, a number of other countries where there are different income tax uh, rates and bans between different jurisdictions, tax jurisdictions within those countries, both in Europe and the US. Uh, so there should be some uh, real-world objective information yep. about how likely people are uh, as a result of modest variations uh, like these or significant variations. Yep. Have you looked at that objective data and we do you have a, a, a clear basis for assuming what level, for example, of relocation uh, would take place uh, at, the, at the very high end of the income scale, where we're, we're not talking about people being very mobile at the start of their careers, but after they've put down roots, built up a network that's important to their career, invested in their home, how mobile really are people? Surely we must know some kind of answer to this. I, I think we have looked at that evidence, and that's, that's been core to the work that HMRC and the Institute of Fiscal Studies um, have done in this area. They've looked at the uh, um, experience within within America, the difference in tax rates between states. And so there is, an, there is a body of mm. uh, knowledge and understanding on this, but I think we should be very careful to think that that will give us the definitive answer. We've, we've had to make judgments. The way we've tried to um, address some of the points you made is... Um, Broadly speaking, the, the recommendation that the Institute of Fiscal Studies have made is to use an elasticity of 0.48, um, which is slightly different from what we, we've done. We've deliberately put in place um, an elasticity such that the impact on 
top, the very highest taxpayers is actually greater than those perhaps between 150,000 and, and 300,000. This is an element of judgment, but we think it's a good judgment reflecting the circumstances where uh, perhaps particularly within the UK under the current structures, people can um, choose to declare their uh, ta taxable income in different places if they have uh, multiple uh, sort of household locations. So there's flexibilities in this. We've made a best judgment based on the informed evidence. So you're not making a prediction about the amount of relocation there would be? We're not making a specific, um, we're not making a forecast on relocation, we're making an overall assessment of okay. the, the, the impact. We're not setting out particular numbers on the impact of relocation or any other effect. Uh, sorry, I think Professor Smith wanted well, to come I can add just one point about relocation. When we're making a comparison like this, you need to think not just of the incentives for people who are currently in Scotland relocating so as to reduce their tax bill. You also have to think about when people in the future have got a choice about where to establish their main residence, then a significant tax difference might affect that that to see the decision to locate rather than the yeah. decision to relocate. Cle clearly, that's a long-term consideration, not one for 2018-19. For uh, but, you know, we, we'll all have to take responsibility for thinking about what, what motivates people. Is it simply the amount of tax they pay or is it something wider about the kind of society they live in? The, 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 the last thing I wanted to ask about is the, the other main behavioural effect that you draw attention to oh. is tax-motivated incorporation. Uh, people moving from being employed to self-employed for tax purposes. Um, have you taken a view about the extent to which that is a genuine move by people from an employed job that they are in into a, a, an area of self-employment and the extent to which it is bogus self-employment uh, in terms of uh, practices by employers to pay their employees as though they are self-employed uh, for tax reasons? I, we, we haven't made any um, ad analysis of the labour market in, in that particular way. I think that would probably be beyond a remit. What we have done is um, you know, taken advice, particularly advice from uh, HMRC, and the, their expectations of tax-motivated incorporation, in um, which is clearly something that is both a, a UK and a, and a Scotland-wide effect, and we've largely used their estimates <coughs> for um, tax motivated co corporation, um, uh, but we haven't done a more detailed so, assessment. So what proportion described. of the behavioural effect is due to incorporation? We, we've, um, we have two separate estimates in this. We have an, an overall tax motivated incorporation will be impacting on <coughs> you know, all, all groups which will be applying irrespective of any change in tax. And then we make a separate estimate of the elasticity of the, of the change in tax. But um, changes to incorporation is, is happening um, across the UK for the circumstances of both the labour market and, and overall tax policy, and that's happening in Scotland too. But there's two separate things in our estimates. So, so you can't tell us what proportion of the, the 51 million that you're saying will be the behavioural effect is due to incorporation? Um, we we are, have, are making a single estimate of the, you know, the overall elasticity and impact, um, which is making 51 million, we're not decomposing that into an effect from incorporation, an effect from relocation or changing status. It's one single overall estimate. But there's a separate estimate of tax motivated corporation affecting all taxpayers under the main report. That, that's separately in the report. So, so, sorry, I, I could add that. Um, that incre the increasing number of tax motivated corporations <coughs> reduces um, income tax revenues in Scotland by around 240 million in next financial year. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, in one of the answers about the, the elasticity rate that you used. The standard rate had been 0.48, but you used a higher rate. What was the figure that was actually used? The, the figures that we've used. Um, uh, the, broadly speaking, an elasticity would be negligible to low at the very low end of tax. So for, certainly for starter rate and basic rate taxpayers, we would expect an elasticity of around about zero. We, we use ju ju just above that. Um, the main elasticities we use um, for um, above 150,000, we use 0.35. Um, 
sorry, my, my apologies, we use um, 0.35 for 150 to 300,000, 0.55 for 300,000 to 500,000, and then 0.75 for above um, uh, 500,000. Um, I know in the government, the Scottish government's latest uh, estimates there, um, they are what they call their medium responsiveness estimate. They use 0.48 throughout the, um, the, the case, which doesn't have the variability that, that we use. Right, okay. And then just in terms of, in your answer to Patrick Harvey, you acknowledged that there were different sources of evidence um, in terms of behavioural changes. How did you weight the different evidence that you looked at in, in order to build the assumptions for your model? I think that's a matter of, of, of pure judgment that we have, uh, as both of my colleagues have explained, um, we have ev evidence, particularly evidence built into the HMRC model, but how we use that in the particular circumstances of Scotland where the reason to suppose that uh, uh, the upper rate taxpayers might be relatively mobile between Scotland and the rest of the UK, it's a matter of judgment of a of of what level of elasticity to apply to them. OK, okay. Ivan. Uh, thanks very much. Um, yeah, I'm looking at table um, 310, where you're laying out these numbers. Um, and first, a technical question. What's the difference between intensive elasticity and extensive elasticity? So the, the intensive elasticity um, is concerned with the basically the hours worked, uh -huh. and the extensive elasticity is concerned with the um, decision to participate in the labour market or to, to move um, right. residents. It comes about um, really that this, this work is based on HMRC modelling, as we've said earlier, and um, HMRC were initially looking at changes in the, the UK additional rate, and that's the intensive elasticity. When there are lots of changes in the allowances, which also apply in Scotland, um, they introduce the extensive elasticity. Right, OK, so the intensive one's the one you're using, the other numbers you just quoted to, to James Kelly, yeah. So Dave, David gave, yes, the intensive elasticity. There's an extensive elasticity of 0.25 throughout from 150 upwards. Yeah, and do you know what the, the, the blended, the weighted average number is on those intensive elasticities when you take into account all the different income bands that you've talked about? So we've got a comparable number against the 0.48. I don't know that off the top of my head. We'd have to get back to you. That's on that. fine. If you come back, yeah. now, the last question, and this is probably the hardest question: um, Is it your remit, and how difficult is it going to be, and are you going to be able to do it at all to come back after the fact and give us a number of what you think the the, the, the outturn has been in terms of elasticity? Obviously, taking into account the complexities around about counterfactuals and forestalling. A very important part of our remit that we review. Uh, that we look back at how our forecasts have performed and, and annually produce a forecast evaluation report, which a few months ago was an evaluation of the Scottish Government's forecasts. Our future evaluation reports will be evaluations of our own forecasts. And yes, we will then look at all of these mm -hmm. as we've been discussing quite complex judgments and judge whether we got them right. So you'll give us a number to see if that 0.75 was... High, low, or right. Yeah. It, it, yes, although I, it has to be said that that even look at, that looking back at what's happened to tax revenue and trying to extract from future Scottish tax revenue how much of the tax revenue change was due to behavioural effects or forestalling yeah. effects is it, not a simple matter. But we will certainly do our best Good luck. to to yeah. evaluate what we're. Thank you. What we've done here. I need to briefly add to that. Just, um, I agree we certainly will need to do that work. We'd very much like to do the sort of analysis that HMRC undertook for the 2010 tax change, you know, evaluating the, the, the impacts. I think it's an important part of our remit. Just two notes of caution. Uh, one is the data probably would be better at a UK level than it would be at a Scottish level. And it, even, at, even with better data, it was very difficult to draw out the detail of, the, of these effects. So a note of caution there. Uh, and the second note of caution is it will probably take us a bit longer to do that assessment because we won't get the sort of le level of detail of information um, through the various uh, sample surveys for you know, two to three years. So it's not something that we will be able to do 
probably in the timetable that ideally we'd all we'd all want. So it might take a bit longer. Yeah. Um, get also important to add that we don't get income tax revenue data for 18 months. Yeah, so we're probably three So you're talking about two knowing. years before we can have a real idea, but obviously okay. next September we will start to have a look at this. Okay. okay, before we move on to another area, you've relied quite a bit on the HMRC model and to some extent the IFS work that's been done. Does that HMRC model contain, only confine itself to issues to do with tax movement, or does it also explore wider issues about council tax, water rates, policy choices by different governments and the effect that that would have on tax? My understanding is, is it's based upon income tax only. Right. But we can again clarify that, but I think that's my understanding. Well, as we develop something, I'm sure these are things that yourself, if that's not a part of the model, it's something that perhaps should be uh, for, for something later for the Fiscal Commission to be thinking about in terms of getting a which is not just a judgment of how much money is in somebody's pocket at that given moment, it's the other factors around about it. So, um, so Can we move on just to um, growth forecasts? And I know there are a number of people interested in this area. Um, and your growth forecasts for Scotland are more pessimistic than the OBR's forecast for the UK. Yet, according to the Scottish budget, and I think it's figure 212, It'll be, the Scottish budget would be better off by 366 million in 2018-19 than would have been the case without fiscal devolution. Could you, is it possible you could explain that for us? Are, are you asking to explain the, the growth between the, the OBR? No. Our, our growth forecast and the OBR growth forecast? Or a, a bit of that, but more, more importantly, how, if that's the case, if we've got slower growth, how come we've got £366 million more to spend? Uh, do you want to have a go at that? So, um, I think the 366 million figure, figure comes from the difference between um, our forecast of income tax revenue and the, the block grant adjustment. And that, in a sense, you know, that comes um, from a number of factors. Um, it comes because our income tax forecast includes the draft budget 17-18 um, higher rate. Um, threshold. Um, and that's roughly six, 60 million in 18-19. Our income tax forecast also includes the impact of announced draft budget 18-19 changes, expected to be around 160 million, and that leaves about 150 million. And that's due to a number of other technical modelling differences between us and the OBR. But one factor which is particularly important in that is the inclusion in our forecast, but not the OBR, of higher public sector pay growth. Okay, so that's the three elements that makes up that 366. Yeah. That's useful. It gets it on the record. Neil, I think you had something in this area. Yeah, on, <coughs> on public sector um, pay increases, I think £60 million pounds is the impact you, that you're forecasting on um, income tax as a result of uh, public sector uh, wages increasing. I understand you've got an assumption um, that public sector wages will grow by 3%, but obviously in the budget last week, um, the Finance Secretary said... Uh, those on £30,000 or less would in increase their wages by 3% and those above by, 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 by 2%. I understand there may be other factors that you've, that you've included in that assumption, just to clarify um, how, you, how you got to the 3% average. Yes, when, when you look at what happens to any pay bill, a public sector pay bill is not just the headline pay increase number that goes into it because there are other factors like pay drift that mean that the, the overall increase in the pay bill uh, is, is different in this case. It's higher than the average increase in the headline pay increase. So I think there's, there's that factor that Alistair's pointed to. There's the, the factor to that the public sector policy that we were given by the government um, in its strictest sense only applies to about half the public sector workers in Scotland. And so we made assumptions um, about the, the remaining of those, and we, we um, and that was we we sort of stuck at a lower level. Um, and could I just clarify that our 1819 assumption on the average public sector pay growth is 3.2 percent? 3.2 percent. Okay. And can I just follow up? What, what assumptions you have you made? Obviously, you made assumptions about the, the average pay. What assumptions have you made about the number of public sector jobs? Um, so the, 
There are around four, 470,000 um, workers in the public sector in Scotland. We estimate this policy applies to approximately 260,000 full-time equivalent workers. Okay. Thanks, Neil. Now, we'll move into areas of growth. There's a number of members interested in that. And, and Ash, I know I, I probably nicked some of your questions at the beginning of that session there. So um, do you want to just ask the first question on growth, sure. and then we'll come to Adam and Ivor. Yeah, good morning. Um, I wanted to ask you about your economic growth rate prediction. So um, with regard to the UK-EU relationship, you say in your paper that um, the negotiation um, will impact negatively on the Scottish economy over the next few years um, due to things like trading arrangements and also due to reduced migration into Scotland, which obviously will then have a, um, a sort of a slowing effect on the Scottish economy. I'm interested, is it possible to isolate the, the Brexit effects? So what can you say what proportion of this sort of lowering of the, of the prediction in the Scottish economy can be attributed to Brexit effects, which obviously are not under the control of the Scottish Government? No, we haven't, uh, we haven't done a modelling exercise without Brexit and then a modelling exercise with Brexit to isolate a Brexit effect. Mm -hmm. So the Brexit effect comes in, it's an important element in our overall judgment of what level of economic growth we're likely to see. And you, you rightly identify that the, the, the things which have gone into that judgment about the effect of Brexit include uncertainty mm -hmm. about what the policy regime is actually going to be, probable reductions in trade in both directions, reductions in migration. Uh, but that has, that's part of our overall judgment of future growth rather than being an element that can be separated out and say, well, mm -hmm. X is the Brexit effect. It's, it's a net negative effect, and we've made it clear we think it's a significantly negative effect, but we haven't done it in a way that separates out a number for Brexit. Okay. And were you, I mean, within the, the three elements that you've mentioned there, you know, the migration, the trade and so on, um, would you be able to put um, figures on, on those three or even what proportion within that negative effect or not? Uh, only in respect of, the mig of some of the migration effect in that our overall forecasts include a population projection and we have chosen a population, we've chosen to use a population projection which has uh, a 50% reduction in EU migration in both directions. So that element is, a, is, is separately identifiable, though I couldn't put a, a straight number on it for you. Mm -hmm. But the rest, no, it's all folded into our overall judgment about economic growth. Okay. And the sort of gloominess of the, the prediction, do you think there's any um, possibility that that could become kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy, you know, if you predict something's going to happen enough times and it is gloomy enough that it begins to have a, a dampening effect? I, I, people can look for themselves at the data that has influenced our, our judgment. Uh, and uh, and the, the, the things which have influenced our judgment are several years of subdued growth in the Scottish economy and indeed in the UK economy. Um, and that period of slow growth has now been so uh, extended that we have taken a view that uh, it's sensible to expect it, sadly, to continue. But I don't think our forecast itself will have a markedly negative effect on people's expectations because the things which have, as I said, the things which have fed into our forecast are there for us all to see. And, uh, and a business is thinking about their prospects for the future will be looking at how business has grown in the recent past rather than much as I'd like them to do, to reading our forecast in great detail. And it's, the, it's their experience of slow growth over the last seven or eight years that will influence their expectations rather than our forecast. Okay, thank you. Okay. Adam. Uh, thank you, Camilla. Um, uh, so we've talked a little bit about um, why your growth forecasts are more pessimistic for Scotland than the OBR's OB forecasts are for the UK. But even if we look just at, the, um, just at Scotland, your forecasts seem to be more pessimistic than any other f uh, published forecast for growth in the Scottish economy. 
um, more pessimistic than the Fraser of Allender, more pessimistic than EY, more pessimistic than PwC, if I've got that right. So what causes you to be more pessimistic about Scottish economic growth than these other forecasters for the Scottish economy? take two things to, to start with that. I, I think the first is um, the key point that we try and draw out in the, in, in the report is the subdued growth that we're forecasting over the, over the next five years probably has two key factors that we wanted to, to draw out. The first is uh, a much more moderate growth in productivity than perhaps we've got used to over the, the, the um, last few years. I think there's a particular table which is in the summary document on page 12, for its figure five, which I think very graphically sets out the very different world that we're in than the expectations which uh, have formed in people's minds uh, perhaps during the uh, 1990s and uh, you know, early th this century that we would get you know, very significant productivity growth. So there's an element about productivity and there's an element, as uh, Alistair said, about, about population. Um, but perhaps the, the, the key thing that comes out of that is that in looking forward, given the strength of the labour market in Scotland, the fact that um, uh, both employment is very high and unemployment is very low, the pot uh, potential sources of um, you know, increase in growth is really going to have to come from boost productivity. And we're in a world environment, this is not a Scottish-specific environment, where productivity improvement is increasingly hard, hard to find. And what we've tried to do in the forecast is, to, is take that into account. Perhaps a crucial point, which maybe hasn't, hasn't come through in, in so much commentary, is our forecasts of productivity going forward for Scotland are slightly less than the, the OBRs, but they're not significantly out of line with the OBRs. Um, the, the overall difference between our projections and the OBR projections doesn't come from the productivity assessment, it comes from the other factors that are going on um, as, as well. So I, I wouldn't say that we're, um, we're in any way out of line with the OBR's assessment of productivity. Um, but what we face in Scotland is a number of factors which have helped boost the economy over the last few years, and perhaps particularly um, pre-2014, the, the, the oil and gas sector in particular, is there, there's the prospects for a number of those elements in the economy which have been um, you know, in difficult circumstances, keeping the you know, growth um, re relatively strong. Um, we're not convinced that they will continue, so we're p facing a, both a world and UK set of challenges around productivity, but we're also facing some particular circumstances in Scotland, which is pointing to the results that we've, we've set up. Um, set out. Um, and perhaps a reminder that we, these are our first forecasts. Um, they're also the first time that there have been you know, official forecasts um, over the, this sort of time period, over the five-year period. Um, and I think it's very positive the Fraser Valner Institute now doing uh, forecasts out to 2020. But you know, as part of our remit, we've had to make some judgments over a long time period using the, the best mod modelling that we've available. And, and these are the, the numbers that come through that systematic assessment. That's helpful. Thank you. Um, it's not just Scottish GDP growth that is forecast to be, <laughs> well, you say, subdued. I mean, I think that's putting it politely. Um, but it's um, Scottish GDP per capita as well, isn't it? And the per capita figures, I really, I think, are, are, are you know, in all sorts of ways, just as important and even more stark, actually, than the overall growth figures. So, what, what, what is your account of the reason why GDP per capita growth in Scotland is forecast to be so poor? I, I think we, all of us, looking at uh, figures for long-term growth, have to recognise uh, that there is a bit of a puzzle about productivity. Low productivity levels are, as David said, something of a worldwide phenomenon. Uh, there are different views about why productivity has sl slowed down. Um, and uh, we're not, we, the Fiscal Commission, are not going to resolve a, a great debate about the origins of, of the productivity slowdown. But our judgment, is based on observing what has happened in the past. And, and per capita, productivity in the Scottish economy, which is the main driver of per capita income, has been, in our words, subdued for a number of years now. And 
while we're not offering a theory as to why that is, as realists, we have to suppose that that experience is going to continue into the future. Could I just add to this a sort of sense of um, exactly what the differences are between per capita growth at the UK level and the GDP? If you look at figure three in the summary report, you'll see there that um, basically GDP per capita growth and GDP in Scotland and in the UK do come together. Um, there's a narrowing gap and they do come together by the end of our forecast period. The, the differences at the GDP level are primarily therefore due to demographic differences. So it's, it's not as, you know, you were using the word subdued, um, and it's still true that um, our, GD, our GDP per capita forecast is subdued, but it does close to the OBR's UK forecast at the end of the period. F final question for me on, on this. Other members want to ask about productivity, so I, sh I shall leave that important though it is. Um, one of the budget documents that was published uh, um, last week was the Scotland Performs Update. Um, and one of the um, uh, um, uh, measurements that caught my eye in that, in that document, which doesn't appear in, in the budget document itself or in your document, is a, is a comparison of Scotland's GDP growth rate with what are described as small EU countries. Um, uh, and this is a, uh, a performance measurement that is, uh, um, in the Scottish Government's own analysis, worsening um, under the current Sc uh, Government's watch. Um, uh, we have lower uh, GDP growth rate than small EU countries and have had ever since the third quarter of 2015. Um, have you got any reflections on, on, on that, either as a valuable perform performance um, measurement, frame, uh, me measurement for, us, for us to take more seriously than perhaps we have done hitherto, or, or, or indeed the reasons why that might be? Well, it's an interesting comparison, and uh, I'm not sure that I've seen the, the exact comparison to which you're referring, but... But uh, there have been comparisons between uh, growth in the UK and growth in the rest of the EU. And it's not that Scotland is... Uh, is uh, Scotland is not alone in, in uh, having subdued growth performance relative to other small EU countries. The UK's growth performance in recent years has been low compared with the, most, of the, most of the rest of the EU. Uh, so one... one uh, Yes, the, the Scottish comparison is relevant, but it may be that it's driven largely by uh, a UK comparison with the rest of Europe. Okay. Ivan? Uh, thank you. Um, and I hate to say it, but um, the, uh, surely the, one of the reasons that perhaps that Scotland's performance compared to other small independent European countries is that we don't have control of all the levers to manage the economy. That's a political judgment which is uh, n not within our remit to pronounce on. <laughs> You'll Maybe. all have your own views on that, yeah. and I doubt that anything the fiscal... If we were to step outside our remit and pronounce on those matters, I doubt that uh, you, yeah, but we, it's a we would fairly, shift any, other, any views around this table. It's a fairly obvious conclusion, <laughs> and I won't waste everybody's time by listing all the, the levers that we don't have control of, that we would have control of, where we're independent. Moving on, um, one of the comments you made was round about um, your assessment that the Scottish economy is actually over capacity at the moment. Um, and I suppose what I just want to explore round about that, we've kind of touched on population. Two things I just wanted to, to touch on. One is you said that your population models, the ONS models you've used, is different from the OBR. You're using a 50% projection model. What is the model that the OBR is using? How different is it and how much different would it make to your forecast had you used the same assumptions? on Scotland's population growth, driven by Brexit, that the OBR is using for UK population growth vis-a-vis -vis Brexit? Sure. I can answer that in two stages, just on the, the, the first point about um, output gap, just to draw the sort of people dimension of all of this. I think it's quite striking. People have noticed and, and looked at the, the overall growth numbers in, in a report and that, seen that as a, a sort of downgrading in some sense. But I think it's quite important to look at if you compare our forecasts with the Scottish Government's forecast at the start of the year, I mean, we're for forecasting um, unemployment uh, significantly lower going forward than, than the Government had done, and, and employment, uh, I wouldn't say significant, but quite a bit higher than, uh, than it had done, So, which, which is 
telling you something both about the nature of the economy and also the fact that the labour market is, um, it, it, particular circumstances, and we're facing a, a, a tighter labour market than I think people were expecting. But on population specifically, we, um, the, in the, the U, overall UK forecast, the OBR have used the principal projections um, which are set out by the Office of National Statistics. So when I make the projections, and I think it's quite important to emphasize they're projections rather than forecasts, and there's a fine detail on that we could go into if needed. They use the principal projections. We could have used the principal projections for, um, for Scotland in our modeling. We chose to use a lower forecast than that, because I think we are um, both concerned about uh, the, the potential impacts of, of uh, Brexit or the, um, and, and just an overall assessment, I think we have that um, issues about migration are a key element of this uh, forecast and it's an, an area of concern. So we use the forecast. In terms of the overall numbers, it probably do, it doesn't make a significant impact at an early stage because um, the, the effect of this assumption is, just to, to draw out the detail on it, um, the, the key element of the population projections is not so much births and deaths, um, which are fairly straightforward to, to um, uh, project. Uh, the key element is net migration. In Scotland, we've gone from a situation 20 years ago or so, there was net out migration. Um, more recently, there's been a uh, fairly significant net uh, in migration. Um, and the, the expert view in, in advising on these forecasts is that the in migration is around about 15,000 a year. Um, it's a bit higher than that over the last couple of years, but that, that's the, sort of the, the benchmark. The implication of the assumption we used is the difference between 15,000 and 12,000. So it's not a significant difference in terms of the overall numbers, but uh, I think it's moving in, in that direction given the circumstances we're in, and it's something that we're very, um, very committed to monitoring at going forward. Could, it, could I just add to that that we have done some sensitivity analysis of our macro forecast. The results are in the full report. Table 2.8, um, and just to back up what David was saying, that there is a migration variant um, in which we use the the, um, the ONS principal um, projection. That produces in a growth rate of 0.9% on average over the five-year forecast for GDP, um, compared to our forecast, which is an average of 0.8. So as David said, it's quite small. And, and, and if I can add, to go back to the point about the output gap, I, I appreciate Many of you may not have the full report in front of you, but figure 212 on page 67 of the, the, the report uh, looks at the relationship between actual GDP and potential output and shows a, a big negative output gap in the years immediately following 2008. Uh, and the output gap in the current numbers is so small that it's not visible in the graph. So, so when we talk about the fact that our focus is based on there being a positive output gap it is a very small positive output gap. The OBR has a very small negative output gap. But we're both we and the OBR are forecasting that the labour market is in quite a tight situation, but, uh, but the gap between potential output and, and actual output is on both of, in both our modelling efforts very small. And it would be more, in a way, it would be more accurate to say we've focusing on an output gap that's very small rather than to focus on whether it's positive or negative. That's clear, thank you, in, in that. But notwithstanding, that still says that that's a constraint on economic growth. Yeah. Yes. Um, so, so I suppose moving on then, the, um, in that scenario, any policy measures that boost the labour supply are clearly quite critical. Um, and I suppose how much cognizance have you taken of, of, of measures that are focused there, for example, childcare, um, skills and training, employability programmes, um, have you taken into those account and taken a step further um, with more focus on those areas or given the focus that there is in those areas, is that something that would increase labour supply and help increase the growth numbers? It certainly has contributed to growth in the past. Uh, the, 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 the figure which David referred to some a little while ago about components of growth over time show that increased labour force participation uh, has <coughs> paid, played a significant role in past growth. We're not forecasting that uh, there are going to be significant effects on labour force participation uh, in the immediate future. Obviously, if there were, that would be a factor that would push us so towards for example, uh, higher growth. 
if a childcare policy steps up a gear as it's planned to do, and that frees up a lot of um, uh, people who are staying at home at the moment to join the labour market, that could have a, a significant impact. It, it, it could, uh, and I think it's important to emphasise that when we in our forecasts don't seem to be taking explicit account of policies like that that might have, have an effect, or policy, for example, or pro-business policies in, in the area of, of non-domestic rates, it's not that we think that these policies have no effect. It's rather that in the timescale that we're looking at, where we're looking for for pretty firm evidence of what the effect of the over overall economy is. Uh, one wants to get some evidence of what the concrete effect might be before you have the confidence to, okay. to feed them into the actual forecast. It's not that we're... It's not that we're the fact that we're not forecasting an increase in participation doesn't mean that we don't think that a childcare policy might... A successful childcare policy might have a significant effect on growth. Thank you. Thank you. Alexander? Thank you, you convener. Um, <clears throat> uh, and, and still on productivity and, and still on the uh, subject of labour supply and migration, which you just started on, um, can I ask what impact does the expanding the economy by attracting low-paid and low-skilled workers have on the productivity measures? I think that's into a, a wider set of questions about, as, as Alistair described earlier, tr trying to understand and explain the, the nature of the economy um, at the moment, where uh, perhaps even more pronounced at UK level, you've seen um, you know, a very, very strong performance in terms of overall employment, in terms of creation of jobs, um, but you've seen um, almost a, 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 an opposite effect in terms of overall productivity. That, that um, what we've tried to do in this uh, assessment is draw out the implications of, of, of that. I think it's, um, as, as you rightly say, if the labour supply were to um, significantly increase or were uh, we to have more people working or the hours worked of people that are already in the labour market, that may in one sense boost, boost GDP, but you'd expect that probably to um, lead to a reduction in productivity which might uh, counter, counteract that. So th these are the sort of issues that we'd be looking to, to uh, model going yeah, forward. But, but um, yeah, I think it's an important point. Yeah, if, we're, if we're operating at overcapacity, as, as you're alluding to, it's not just about creating jobs, it's about creating the right level of jobs. Absolutely. And I'm just wondering, is there, a, is there a salary point where the creation of a job it, it has a positive effect on productivity as opposed to otherwise? I, I, I don't think that it's a matter of looking at a salary point, it, it, but it is, a, as David said, the general pattern in the UK in recent years has been that there has been very healthy growth of overall employment numbers, but it, it has been uh, the more flexible labour market has led to the growth of low productivity in, Employment, but, and, and that would still work in the rest of the UK, which is operating at undercapacity. But in Scotland, where we're at overcapacity, it's not just about jobs. I, I, as I said, as I said a moment ago, the difference in being over and under capacity between Scotland and the rest of the UK is really small. Uh, it, uh, it, it's better to think that, on best estimates of where we are across the whole of the UK, unemployment is historically at low standards, uh, and therefore the whole UK economy might be judged to be at or about capacity. Okay, thank you. Uh, and just finally, yeah, we, yeah, we're hopefully seeing an increase in pay in the public sector, but yeah, without any improvement in outputs, uh, how does that contribute to uh, declining productivity? Uh, that's... The, looking at productivity in public services, and indeed to some extent in services generally, is quite a difficult thing to do, and it's not something that we've addressed here. Thank you. Okay, moving to slightly different areas now. Um, Willie, I think you've got a question on LBTT. Yeah, thanks very much, Bruce. It was just a, a couple of questions on land and buildings, transaction tax in your paper. Your forecasts are actually quite buoyant, I think, compared to, to last year. Could you give us a little bit of a background as to why you think that is and what are the main factors driving that? Is it something to do with the change in the first-time buyer policy or are there other factors that are giving us giving rise to this more buoyant uh, estimate from you? Um, 
Bond estimate, like many of our other estimates, is based on recent experience. The recent experience in the, the residential market has been, uh, uh, by historical standard, by recent historical standards, quite a high level of transactions and and uh, and and, pri and price increases, and we we projecting that to continue. I don't think it's, it's particularly the fact that both uh, in compared to um, the the sort of pre-financial crash, so we, we've not returned to those sort of levels, but certainly there's been a very substantial recovery in um, both the level of transactions and of overall house prices. Um, I think the, the emerging evidence that I think particularly this year is um, there has been a, perhaps particularly an increase in prices which I don't think had been um, you know, f fully uh, anticipated. We expect that to continue um, certainly for the, the rest of this year, perhaps into the start of next year, um, before uh, we then estimate more a, sort of a, a reversion um, to uh, what we're describing, not, not quite as a new normal, which is a term that's been uh, kicked around at the moment. So it's not, certainly not going back to previous pre-2008 levels. But the, the housing market is doing well at the moment, um, as price increasing, perhaps particularly at the upper ends of, of, of the market, and that's set to continue, I think, in the near term. And that's the principal factor that explains the increase in the overall, um, the, as we describe it, the, the pre-measures forecast is quite significantly increased on what, what was anticipated last year. And then the first time buyer's relief that the government has announced that separately model and that will that will lead to a reduction in what our forecast would otherwise have been by, of, of the order of uh, five or six million. Yeah, but you're, you're predicting maybe up to uh, 200 extra transactions as a result of the first time buyer policy. How do you how do you arrive at that figure, if you don't mind me asking? How do you get that? Is there some kind of secret calculation in there? No, it's, an, it's another of those elasticities <laughs> from, 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 uh, that, that's in line with work that the OBR has done on, on the effects of changes in, uh, in stamp duty land tax in the, in the UK. In, in England and Wales, rather. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's based on, uh, m uh, as I say, one of those elasticities. Established models elsewhere, is it? Yeah. The, the six so million that it costs, the policy costs six million to, to deliver, but do you still think overall the, the revenue raised through the LBTT will increase? Yes, the, the, yeah. the increase is substantially greater than that. Despite six the cost million. of the policy. So, so, yeah. so, um, and, and this will be, there'll be a significant number will be affected by, by the, this change. I mean, the, the, broadly, we, we, we estimate that um, around sort of 12,000 transactions will be, you know, will be affected by the, uh, by the change that's put, that's put in place. Um, so our, you know, our, our estimate is, is more whether, how, how it impacts on the first time buyers uh, compared to other buyers that, that are in, in the market. Um, so there will be a reduction, but what that, that uh, leads to in effect is there's, there's a risk that um, rather than the first time buyers seeing that as a, a, as a personal saving, it's a, a further contribution that well, we might put, push up house prices. Um, so there will be beneficiaries, but whether or not it's the first time buyers themselves is, is a factor that come into account. It may well be the seller rather than the buyer mm -hmm. that's, that gains the benefit. Okay. Thank you. I move into another area, block grant adjustment, um, Murdo. Thank you, uh, convener. Um, I just want to explore a little bit more of this issue around the connections between uh, your um, projections on uh, economic growth, your projections on productivity and the impact that has on the uh, tax revenue and the Scottish block grant. So your forecast assumes that productivity growth will be much lower in Scotland than um, across the UK as a whole. Uh, and you're obviously projecting much lower economic growth in Scotland com compared to the rest of the UK. But you seem to be suggesting that earnings growth and therefore income tax revenues in Scotland will be roughly equivalent to our UK levels. So why do you draw that conclusion from the input data? Why do we conclude that, that the Scottish income tax will be growing more than the block grant adjustment? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, the, the, the block grant adjustment is based on a calculation of per capita of what ha what's happening at the per capita level to tax receipts. And, uh, and as we've already discussed, at a per capita level, the gap between our projections and the OBR projections uh, is, 
is positive, but not, not it's, it's not a, it's not a, it's not as big a gap as the, the gap in in actual GDP growth. Um, and so, so the effect of a small difference in the, the in our growth rate assumption is basically overridden by the fact that Scotland ha last year and now again this year is introducing revenue raising income tax changes that raise income tax above the level that it would have been had uh, Scotland stuck with the UK income tax rate and that's that's the factor that's primarily dri driving the difference between our income tax projections and the the block grant adjustment figured. Okay, thank you. Um, if I look at figure nine on the summary paper you've given us, which is comparisons of income tax forecasts with your previous forecast from February 2017, the, clearly there's quite a large gap. I think it amounts to uh, 2.1 billion over the next four years between what you previously forecast and what you're now forecasting. What impact is that gap likely to have on the level of the Scottish Block Grant, or is it not possible to say it at this stage? Well, the the the, 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 the Scottish the, I mean, the Block Grant adjustment uh, depends on. OBR projections of UK growth, and uh, and those projections have been revised down as well. Um, so um, I, looking at my colleagues, but I don't think that we're going to. I don't think there are any. There aren't any sig significant implications from this change on the block grant because it's a change that the OBR is making as well. And I think that's, that, to me, that's the important point, is that, um, and, and just to clarify, the, the difference that you, you, you identified is between the Fiscal Commission, our forecasts now, compared to the Scottish Government's forecasts um, of the year, and the sort of, the, the broad magnitude of the change in that forecast is actually, um, it's very similar, it's actually a bit less than the change in the OBR's forecasts from last year to, to this year. So this, this is part of the overall picture of the, the way um, your know, forecasts ha have changed. But in terms of the block grant adjustment, the critical numbers are the baseline number, which is the 2015-16 estimate of income tax revenue. And in order to, and then that is up, up rated by the growth in UK taxes. They're the, the two key numbers, if you, if you like. Um, and for the assessment of the block, or the, the calculation of block grant adjustment that's been put, put in place for this budget, it's using our forecast of the 2015-16 budget. And just to clarify, yes, it's still a forecast for 2015-16, um, um, uh, because we won't get the outturn, the actual numbers of that, until summer uh, next year. Uh, and then in future, the, uh, the block grant adjustment will be calculated based on those actual outturns. Um, but th that, th they are the critical numbers going forward rather than um, the difference between the Scottish Government and our, our forecast. Okay. Thank you. Ivan, the supplementary to that. Yeah, absolutely. So to just, just to clarify on that, so um, is it fair to say that it's not sensibly compare those two numbers because they're both starting from different baselines. The, the, the Scottish Government and our, yes, and correct. our numbers. They, they, it's, it's part of developing an overall picture and overall understanding how things have changed. But in terms of the calculation of the block grant adjustment, I, I, I think they tell you other things. They don't advise you too much about the actual calculation of block grant adjustment. So, so it's not saying something about the impact of the policies or, or anything like that. What it's saying is that because you've taken a, a view on the baseline for 15, 16, it's different. The, the, the arithmetic has calculated these numbers in this way. They're not a consequence of policy decisions as such. Um, I, I think Table 3.6 sets out a very sort of detailed assessment which decomposes how we have got to our numbers compared to the, the Scottish Government forecast. But, but just to clarify, you know, comparing current forecasts with what was done a year ago 
is a valuable exercise of, of, of comparison. But just just to repeat the um, the, the I think the number was mentioned about about sort of uh, two billion pounds sort of cumulative uh, difference based on the comparison between our forecasts and uh, um, the Scottish government forecasts. Um, that's a slightly greater difference between the two OBR forecasts. And even if you look at UK estimates in terms of the difference between OBR's estimates um, of forecasts now compared to what they said a year ago, it's about a 20 billion di difference. It's just that's how far we have moved in terms of our overall assessment of <coughs> forecasts, uh, income tax in Scotland, but also in the UK. That's clear. So that's not something specifically Scottish about that difference? I wouldn't say. There, there, are, there are Scottish elements to it in terms of the detail, but the broad picture of the impact of downgrading of productivity assumptions um, is, is relevant to the UK as well as Scotland. Thank you. Emma, I think you want to cover some areas on pay. Yeah, um, thank you, convener. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm interested in the information about carers' allowance and the fact that the carers' allowance is forecast to increase over, um, I guess, over the next few years with caseload and weekly rate increasing in line with CPI inflation. And I'm interested in your views about the significant numbers of women that are carers. More women are nurses. There's about 89% of women that are nurses. Um, and the mid-range salary band five level will actually benefit from the budget proposals. So I'm interested in your thoughts or your views about uh, about the 70,000 odd women who are carers and nurses who will actually benefit. Our, our forecast, our, our uh, focus has been on forecasting uh, the. The, 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 the likely cost of uh, the carers' allowance, and we haven't gone into detail on um, the, the breakdown of the people who, who will be receiving it. We're, we're not making an analysis of the policy as such. I should remind everybody I'm a nurse myself, yeah. actually. Um, and 18 months ago, I was one of those band sixes who would benefit if the draft budget is approved. So you're talking about the, the government's pay, pay policy and the benefit mm -hmm. from that and the impact of the government's pay policy upon our forecast of carers' allowance. We didn't make that, that connection. We received the, the, the government's policy, pay policy information very late in our forecasting <laughs> round, and so we haven't taken that explicit account, explicit account of that particular policy change for our carers' allowance forecast. And the carers' allowance is set to... Um, it's going to be increased to match the rate of job seekers allowance so ultimately we're going to have challenges with we've st spoke about our labor workforce and uh, others have mentioned the three percent and the two percent <coughs> as well so will there likely be a, I guess an increase in the input required to support the needs for further carers allowance as our population grows older Uh, that, that's something you would look at in your remit, is it? No. 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 Okay. The, 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 that's a matter for the government, not for us. Okay. Okay. But, but I think your, your initial point, and as John said, I think it's a very valuable one of, of trying to identify if, if the pay policy has a, an impact on the, the, the modelling that we, we developed. We didn't take that into account, and it may well be that we need to look at those numbers and, and try to make the assessment that you've, you've suggested, and that's perhaps something we can c come back to you with. But, but to be clear, evaluating different policies and different needs and making recommendations to the government on how they might change a CARES allowance, that's clearly not, not for us. But understanding the implications of the pay policy for the detail of the numbers is something that we're, we're very keen to monitor, and perhaps we can come back to you on. Okay. Let's pull that out, because that's quite interesting, actually, because you're, you're saying because you got too late, you got the, the information about pay for, to, to make a, to build it into your assumptions. Is that something you could let us know about uh, a bit more detail? Is it possible you can do that in the timescales involved? What we can do here is, is that we can be very clear about how the information on the public sector pay policy fed into our forecasts right. and in, in, 
in summary, um, it fed very much into our income tax forecast because we had the time to do that. It didn't feed in any, anywhere else. Um, we're certainly intending to talk to the government about when we get details on, on pay policy. So the earlier we get those in the forecasting round or a sense of those, the more work we can do, the more account we can, we can look at the question that you've raised. Um, I think for this time, I think we, you know, we, we, we've, we've done our forecast on the best information we had available okay. at the time. Okay. Patrick. Thank you, Convener. It was just on that, that last point that John Ireland mentioned. You said you have had time to look at the impact that the pay policy as proposed will have on income tax. Is that significant? Um, it is, and I think we have a breakdown of the impact of pay policy on income tax. I can't put my hand, but we can certainly let yeah. you know about that. If, it, if, it's, if it's in the full document, I'll dig it out, but I haven't seen that I'm when I was I'm pretty sure it's it. in the full document. Okay, thank you. If I just a very brief point on that, I think what John has said, I think I also said about receiving the information too late. I, don't, I think it was probably too late for us to do a proper assessment of, rather than too late in the sense that the government didn't give us the information broadly in the times of the protocol. So it wasn't a, it wasn't a, a sort of lateness in, in that sense. But I think it, as the budget process is going through, um, certainly you know, during January, in terms of further consideration of this, we're, we're happy to, to make a further assessment if, if, if that would be useful. OK, I think the, the, the last question is from Neil and APD, I think. Yeah, it was just to ask, um, in your forecast, your um, forecast in revenues of 306 million for APD in 18-19, um, and the forecast in the financial memorandum by the Scottish Government for the ED, APD um, bill, it was forecast in revenues of 326 million in 1819, um, and and in your own forecast rising to 336 million by 21-22, and in the financial memorandum by 378 million by 21-22. You've 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 rightly pointed out in the in your in your summary document that there's. Uh, been an increase in Scottish passenger numbers and you're expecting revenues to increase over the five-year period. Um, I just wanted to understand why there was the difference, however, between um, what was forecast in the financial memorandum by the Scottish Government and by the FS SFC. Um, I don't have the answer to that. We can certainly have a look at that. OK, well, thank you. Th thank you very much. Um, I'm very grateful for you, for you being here today. It reminds me to thank you very much for being here. I wish you a good festive period. And can you pass her on the same to Lady Rice, who unfortunately couldn't be with us to complete the evidence session. But I now suspend this meeting for about five minutes to uh, change all the witnesses. Thank you.
the second item on agenda today is to continue our evidence gathering on the Scottish Government's draft budget for 2018-19, and we're joined for this item by Neil Amner, who's the Director and Chair of the Economic Advisory Group in the Scottish Chambers of Commerce, Russell Gunson, the Director of IPPR Scotland, and Dave Moxham, for the Deputy General Secretary from the STUC. And I'd like to thank you all very much for the contributions you've already provided in the written format. And I think it's probably just fair to ask you just for a, each for a couple of minutes at the beginning to lay out what you think are your priorities for the budget, um, you know, where you see as the advantages, the disadvantages, just to give us an overview for a couple of minutes, that would be helpful. So I don't know who would like to go first. Neil, you want to kick off? Absolutely fine, yeah. Um, I suppose from a Chamber of Commerce perspective, um, nobody likes, is everybody quite likes getting something for free, something uh, extra cash in their pocket, that you run up to Christmas. Nobody quite likes paying a little bit extra for something we don't giving back. That said, um, the business community, you know, have people's perspective is, is broad and their um, take on the budget will be different. None of the numbers in the budget are particularly uh, decisive in terms of people's spending pa patterns or the investment programmes, but there are a number of um, points that do come out of it. One is the potential impact of a new structure on discretionary spend. Um, for a number of pressures uh, on people's disposable income. We, we know there's a mismatch between um, take-home pay and cost of inflation in recent years, price rises, a number of other fiscal measures which are impacting on that. Um, Auto-enrolment, council tax, um, you know, apprenticeship levy, etc., cetera, coming to business. At the current percentage differentials, there's, um, say it's not particularly uh, Crucial, either in terms of positive for those who are winning out of this or negative for those who are paying a bit more tax. People's perception of that will vary according to their own personal perceptions. A lot of people will say, well, actually, I don't mind paying a little bit more if we get better public services, if there's better support for business coming out of this. But if, having set that new structure, the percentages across the bands, the differentials increase, then there could be uh, an incremental effect on discretionary spend. Less money in people's pockets means they're less able to go out more frequently. At individual level, maybe at the top end here, um, being you know a few hundred pounds worth off, worse off won't make a difference at that level. But if it goes up to a couple of thousand pounds, then you can see the impact will come through on people's spending habits. That also then links into economic resilience. You know, we know that people's um, there was an article in the press the other day about people being concerned about being only a couple of pay packets away from concerns about keeping a roof over their heads. Um, if, as budgets are already tight. Some people are having more constraint, and this is very individual circumstances across the different income bands. But if people's uh, ec people's natural uh, inclination will be to put less money into their pension, less money into their savings, whatever, so that will impact on that. Um, all of that leads to potential pay pressure across both public and private sectors, and affordability issues. I think we appreciate that um, the cabinet secretary is having to strike a fine balance and you and the committee and the rest of parliament will have to find a balance across a number of competing pressures in this. But probably our biggest concern with the, the budget proposals is one of perception, one that putting in a new structure creates the impression, at this page only an impression really, that Scotland is a higher tax jurisdiction than the rest of the UK. That, will, that could incrementally have an effect on people's decision whether or not to relocate or to work in Scotland or stay in Scotland. Um, we know already that there are pressures on recruitment and skill shortages already, and we also know that there are pressures from the Fiscal Commission, I think you heard from before, before we came in, um, about the prospects for the economy. At a perception level, if someone is deciding to accept a post in Scotland or to uh, locate their business in Scotland or retain their business in Scotland, the differential tax rates, the difference across the UK, even the simple thought, oh, hang on a minute, Scotland's different, how is it different, could become a barrier. I'm not saying at 1% here or there, it's, it is a barrier, <laughs> but the structure, particularly if it is amplified with higher percentages across the bands and differentials between the rest of the UK, could get worse through time. And that's a concern I think we have as to setting the precedent of where that would then lead to is in, say, three or four years' time. And there are also there are a few... Um, anomalies with the tax system that we would have liked to see addressed. We welcome uh, the implementation of the Barclay Review, uh, but there are a couple of things there, for example, in the staircase tax, where you have uh, a business having um, several floors in the one building disconnected 
they get two separate rates bills, proportionally higher than if they're treated as one property. Uh, and there are some uh, anomalies in LBTT, for example, compared to SDLT south of the border, where uh, there's group relief south of the border. If you have a property from one company and a group to another company, you don't pay SDLT, whereas you do pay LBTT in Scotland. So those are indications of a bit like the income tax perception issue, um, creeping in a, in, in incremental elements that build up the cost of doing business in Scotland compared to the rest of the UK, which um, at an individual itemised level are not necessarily significant, but taken together, and particularly the perception it creates, could be problematic. And all of that then leads to hidden costs of additional overheads, both for individuals, for businesses already here, and for those thinking of locating or investing in Scotland, you know, that, that extra tax, you know, what is the tax difference? Checking that, making sure actually, particularly for those on low incomes, where a number of benefits and other uh, tax calculations are driven by the UK base, basic rate, people checking they're paying the right amount of tax could become an issue for them individually. Okay, I, I'm sure that we'll get some different perspectives from the the panel, but um, Russell, Dave, who'd like to go to next? Um, thank you very much, and thanks for the invitation to give evidence today. Um, overall, we think there's a lot to welcome in the budget, but with uh, in the draft budget as proposed, but with some important caveats. Um, to us, the income tax rises are necessary and therefore welcome, and will provide sufficient money, at least on the day-to-day -day spending side of things, in terms of our Dell, to prevent real terms cuts for most departments, and that is welcome. Clearly within that, though, local authorities and rural um, connectivity and the economy have, have faced harder settlements, but there's a lot to welcome in terms of NHS, college, skills and universities uh, in terms of real terms increases. The income tax cut element, though, is something we think isn't well targeted at the poorest households, and that's something we can get into potentially in, in questions, and it will benefit uh, a number, at least, of uh, low earners in high income households, so second earners, in essence. Um, to us, the business tax um, allowances or the cuts in revenue are also uh, problematic at a time when the grant um, is also facing a real terms cuts that's going to local authorities too. And even a maximum increase in council tax won't be enough um, to claw that money back. And so where that leaves us is, whilst this is welcome for this coming year, um, beyond this coming year, there are uh, deep cuts stemming from UK government decisions um, still to come. And so whilst the income tax rises are uh, necessary and welcome, this will only buy us one year our analysis shows that there's around £250 million worth of cuts to day-to-day -day spending in 1920. And if you include NHS increases and police protection, that increases to around £350 million for non-protected departments. So that's a significant cash terms cut, never mind real terms cut. And that leads us to where um, some of our focus is on, which is beyond this next year. So in the medium term, tax rises won't be sufficient to prevent cuts in Scotland, given the state of the UK-wide economy and spend the decisions from the UK government. Therefore, what we need to do is, alongside scrutiny of this coming year, is focus on how we can get Scotland's economy a tax revenue per head, productivity rates increasing so that, in the medium term, tax revenue can increase through a stronger economy rather than only through um, tax increases. And that's why looking beyond this year, whether that be through multi-year spending settlements, a tax framework that lasts beyond this coming year, would be a very welcome thing for us, but also for the wider economy too. Dave? Yeah, uh, thanks very much. Um, uh, three priorities, um, investment in public services, which for us, of course, in, uh, involves investment in public service workers pay as well. Um, the tax policy that we need to meet that um, and the parts of business investment uh, that we think are good, uh, the parts of business investment that we think are un unevidenced um, and, and need further work. On the first of those, um, you'll not be surprised to hear that we believe that every public service worker in Scotland, every public service worker in Scotland deserves at least an inflation level um, pay rise. And, and we use RPI because most people have housing costs uh, to calculate that. Um, but that's part of a wider picture in, in terms of public service investment that 
that we need. Um, we don't believe uh, that the tax proposals that have been brought forward are ambitious enough to meet that, either in terms of quantum uh, or in terms of the way that it's structured. We would tend to concur, um, maybe counterintuitively, but um, with IPPR, that really tinkering about with the um, uh, tax band at the lower level probably doesn't do what it, what it says or what it purports to say on the tin, um, and that a simpler approach would have been to hold tax rates uh, for everybody on medium wages and above, but then to build a more progressive and, and we would say more ambitious um, uh, um, uh, a scheme to follow that. In terms of business investments, some really welcome stuff in terms of cap capital investment, um, uh, the capitalization of the investment bank, uh, a range of things that we think can help to stimulate the economy, some welcome work to make up for what we think will be a shortfall otherwise in uh, construction work over the next uh, couple of years. But a real concern, and it's reflected in the Fiscal Commission's report, that um, some of the um, uh, business rate measures aren't really, have never been proved um, to have any measurable effect on the economy. We can continue to argue that the small business bonus scheme is wrongly constructed and that if you are going to construct um, support for small business, you may need to be far more focused and far more outcome focused in terms of how you, you approach it. Okay, well, thank you very much for that <coughs> overview. We'll begin with Neil. On you go, Neil. Thanks, Convener. Good morning. Um, um, According to Spice, there will be £135 million real terms cuts in, in revenue funding to councils. Can I just ask you, do you believe that councils have been allocated sufficient money to maintain and protect services, and what will the impact be of such cuts on local services? So, yes, there's a £185 million real terms cut before you bring in <clears throat> the ring fence sp um, specific grants, so £135 million real terms once you do. The thing to note there, so I mean, directly, clearly a real terms cut risks real terms diminution in quality of services, particularly when, as Dave mentioned, your cost side. So this is all looking at the spending side, if you like. But the cost side facing local authorities is under big pressure from pay. We'll see what happens with local authority um, pay settlement. But beyond that, in terms of uh, pressures on services, for example, from benefits cuts from the UK government, pressures on services due to the tough time that many individuals and households are having out there. Um, so in general terms, this is a risk. I think specifically also there's some very big spending commitments within that budget. So the attainment gap money, the free childcare money um, is within that. So everything outside of those things is maybe facing a, a tougher time even than those. So in short, it is tough. It's one of the toughest. Having said that, it would be a lot tougher without um, the income tax changes that the Scottish Government um, have proposed. Yeah, um, uh, concern, we were concerned last year, and obviously some um, remedial action was taken post the first draft budget, which, which we went on to welcome. We, we remain concerned. Um, it's important to note, and um, obviously you'll expect me to talk a little bit about public service workers' pay today, uh, that as far as we can see, um, although the Finance Secretary um, argued that he wanted to see a public sector pay rise across the whole of, of the public sector, he didn't ask the Scottish Fiscal Commission uh, to model um, public sector pay rises as part of that. So we're, we're stuck in this slight situation where he didn't ask, he said he wants it, but he didn't ask them to model it. Um, and there is obviously a significant cut that we've just talked about. So we think it will impact on those pay negotiations. Uh, we also think that it will impact on service delivery generally. And I think I kind of want to link that really to, you know, is Scotland a good place to do business and not just the, um, uh, not just the welfare of the people of our, uh, of our towns and cities or, or, or the workers? Because if you have underfunded planning departments, if you have underfunded um, uh, core services that councils provide that allow businesses to operate, and I'm quite certain that the Chambers of Commerce will have plenty of complaints about the slow running of the planning uh, service in, in, in various cities. If you have that, if you don't have that and you don't have that investment, then it's a real hit to business as well as a real hit to the livelihoods of, of the people we represent. Yes, the Chambers of Commerce have long acknowledged, I mean, I've certainly in every context um, acknowledged that the, the economy is in essence an organic thing. It has a number of components which need to all work together in an efficient manner. So business relies upon the public sector and the local authorities in particular for a great many of the support services and um, uh, facilitation services that allow business to function in the same way as having a healthy private sector to employ staff to um, uh, 
have wages to pay tax, etc., is important for the wider economy too. So, um, as I said earlier, I appreciate that there is a balance to be struck by the committee and by Parliament more generally, um, and we would have concerns uh, uh, about uh, severe cuts to uh, council services. Equally, or on individual uh, members of the public and for businesses, there will be concerns about how that's funded. And a balance has to be struck. But, for example, significant rises in council tax will compound pressures already on, on households. Um, and uh, the Barclay Review took uh, a considerable amount of time and effort and a great many experts to come to its conclusions uh, because the, the non-domestic rate system has been shown uh, not to be functioning in a manner that is fair or pragmatic. And um, so there's, there's a balance to be struck there. I think there's some of the other uh, proposals in the budget, um, you know, given the time scales when they were announced to today, was it the time, was, uh, time to, we need time to reflect on them and consider them, the potential impacts uh, more deeply. But the, the point about the effects on uh, local authority budgets and spending, yes, that would be a concern to business, but we appreciate a balance has to be struck. Space that uh, tells us between 2010-11 and 2017-18, local government revenue funding has fallen by 8.5%. Uh, Scottish government revenue has fallen uh, by 5.1% in comparison. Uh, do you, from what you're saying, do you uh, believe local government should get a fairer settlement? COSLA have said um, that £545 million pounds is needed just to stand still um, and Subsequently to that, can I ask how much mon more money do you think local authorities should get um, in the budget? I certainly think, at the very least, at the very least, we'd be looking at a reversal of what you describe in terms of the real terms cut. Um, but you also rightly point out that this is part of a sequence of um, uh, of, of cuts, which, which really are just um, unsustainable. Um, I think it's important to say. I mean, R R R Russell said the Scottish Government raised some more money, or the, these proposals raised some more money in respect of income tax. A large part of that just disappears straight away on business, um, uh, on, on, on business cuts. So actually, we're not talking about that level of investment in public services, far from it. So yes, we've, we've argued for more, um, uh, um, more ambitious tax proposals, and we believe that probably the first port of call for that, um, for that additional revenue should be, should be to local government. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> the point you're making is that this comes on the back of a you know, number of years of cuts in real terms to local authorities, and that means the opportunities for sort of low-hanging fruit around efficiencies has most likely already been um, used up. Now there may be others, but I think um, you know getting to the point of a real terms freeze, real terms protection um, could be an aim uh, over the course of the budget process. I think Dave's absolutely right to point out that, so there's council tax that can go up by 3% um, to help mitigate some of these cuts facing local authorities. The business rates um, revenue will be dropping by about £100 million per year, um, whereas the Barclay review was, the remit of that was to be cost neutral. So there are tax or business tax raising um, revenue raising uh, proposals that were within the Barclay Review that haven't yet been implemented. So we can see whether there's anything there that can happen in time for this year. The point I would make though is that equally whilst we might be able to fix this for this year or not, um, the deep spending cuts begin again next year unless we look to what we can do in the medium and long term. Some of that might be further tax rises, some of that might be further spending from the UK government if it changes its plans. But most of all, that has to come through a stronger economy. And so testing every spend, you know, we can, we can look at these things almost on a spreadsheet, but every bit of penny that goes out the door probably needs to be tested against our twin priorities as a country of inclusive growth and of narrowing inequalities. And that applies as much to local authorities wherever we end up as it does to the other parts of the budget. I would broadly agree with, with that balance that Russell's just spoken about. Um, the pre pre accepting the pressure on, on local authorities. Um, there are a number of areas where we need to be very careful about the law and any consequences. So uh, protect, if we were to um, protect the council budgets in the way that, that Dave and Neil have, have, have referred to, the question is how is that paid for? Uh, 
one option would be raising council tax. Another option could be to roll back on some of the concessions to rates. But we've already heard um, both for the Fiscal Commission and through other evidence through um, business surveys, for example, about the fragile state of the economy. Um, and we know, for example, that the retail sector has had significant difficulties, as has the hospitality sector, with, which actually led to um, uh, the Barclay Review. So I would urge, I don't have an answer for you, but I would urge caution as to, as to how you proceed in the sense that um, it would be a perverse outcome that we, we compounded problems in the wider economy by not implementing the Barclay Review uh, concessions which were, uh, which, which, which were proposed through Barclay on the basis of, of real difficulties being encountered by business. Um, if the rates uh, system is not reformed, but the way, it was, the way it's being proposed to be reformed, there could be significant impacts, both on individual businesses, but on the wider economy in the back of that. Sorry, are you finished? Oh, Neil, just, apologies, just, apologies on, Neil, on you go. Just on the issue of, of council tax, um, Russell, you said that 3% increase in council tax wouldn't be enough to avoid all the cuts. So it's fair to say that council taxpayers could be facing a 3% increase in council tax and more service cuts as well, um, as things stand. Um, but also can I ask the panel, for low-income taxpayers on the lowest council tax bands, we've heard um, uh, they're facing a, an income tax reduction, uh, the Fraser Valens Institute work out about £20 a year. Um, have you looked at whether they would be better or worse off after that tax reduction, but also 3% going up on their council tax? The council tax, if, if councils choose to use the power available to increase by 3%, that would roughly be keeping it, in real terms, static. So um, inflation is running at around 3% just now. Um, so it depends. You, there's been talk about baselines and who's better off and who's worse off in terms of the income tax policy. It's similar for council tax. Um, in terms of the specific point, if all councils across Scotland raise, use that power to raise council tax by 3%, um, it's estimated it would bring in around £75, £77 million pounds a year. That would bring cuts down to around um, £60 million in real terms. So again, less significant than local authorities have faced in recent years. It would be a lot deeper without the tax changes that the Scottish Government are proposing, but it's still a real terms cut on very pressured services. Neil, you okay? Yep. Right. Willie, you've got a supplementary in this yeah, area? Yeah, thanks very much. It's in this area of local government, the support for local government. I mean, do you acknowledge and accept that the support for additional support for local government is, is clearly in there. If you look at the spice figures, you'll see the baseline settlement for local government is listed as ten point three eight billion pounds. But when you add in all the extra support for for local government for things like discretionary housing payments, the welfare fund, even support for the attainment challenge fund and schools for the future, that takes us up to about eleven point three billion pounds. Do you, so do you acknowledge that that is there? That's additional support for local services. So yeah, for um, once you include, so the the way we've looked at this is around resource spending, so um, not including capital, not including financial transactions, not including lending, um, looking at day-to-day -day spending budgets. Um, and as I say on that, if you include all of the things you mentioned around attainment gap, etc., um, it does bring the cuts down to around £135 million in real terms if councils use their council tax power to mitigate that further it would bring it down to around £60 million that's a lot less than we've seen but it is still a real terms cut On top of that you've got the support for health and social care integration that's going in to support local services as well plus reforms to the, the council tax system itself I mean, this is, these are substantial additions Plus, there's a £90 million extra capital yeah. going into local government, plus the discretion to implement the 3% should councils choose to do so. So there are levers and, and, and discretions there that councils can apply, plus this additional support. I'm just asking, do you acknowledge that I mean, that's with, there? With, with respect, I, um, I, I recognise what you say, but I do think you're mix and matching different things. You're mix and matching uh, capital spending. You're mix and matching things which have become Scottish Government priorities announced by the Scottish Government, such as the living wage and care and health and social care integration, and then allocating those budgets to um, local authorities as if it was always their responsibility to deliver on them. So when the 
so when, when the responsibility when the responsibility shifts jurisdiction, you're still left with a set of services that local authorities previously would have had to deliver that they now have less money to deliver on. Some of those are statutory obligations and some of those are, are expected obligations. And on those obligations, local authorities have less money now than they did last year and, and sequentially over many years to deliver those. I don't think we can get away from, from that fact, even though I accept that some of the programmes you talk about with respect to local services services are ones that we would welcome. Local councils are delivering these services. But, 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 sorry, local, just to repeat, the, the, services. The, the services that they previously delivered before these announcements were made, they have less resource to deliver than they previously did, and that's the, that's the base level. It's also an important point to make that we, certainly in the trade union movement, I hope the Parliament generally, um, should um, uh, value local authority autonomy, and therefore we tend to prioritise in very clear terms the spending areas where local government actually has the discretion to act and, and act responsive to its own local citizens rather than in, in other ways. So, I was just going very briefly, so, um, in the same way, so we wouldn't. Um, so when we're looking at the Scottish Parliament's budget as a whole, you could look at the whole budget, including financial transactions, capital, lending powers, etc., and that would tell you one story. Um, we very much at the Scottish Parliament level focused on the resource day-to-day -day spending, um, and likewise, that's what we've done at local authority level. But you're right um, to suggest there are capital um, investment going to local authorities, particularly for childcare, which is um, a really positive thing. There's additional money going on the attainment gap funding, which is absolutely the right priority. Um, so whilst you can focus on the negative, there are positives there. But overall, in terms of that day-to-day -day spending, um, again, um, what, we're, what we're seeing is that there will be a real terms cut, even if councils use their council tax power, uh, albeit one that's much less than it's faced in recent years. So just on that, that point on the health and social care money, it's £355 million. Are you saying, Dave, that the local councils don't have a role in delivering that? I'm not saying they don't have a role, but just to repeat my but, point, services that local authorities would previously have been expected to deliver under their statutory and, and, and other obligations receive less money than they previously did. Many of these additional programmes are welcome. I think that health and social care is still working through. We're still having a look, for instance, to make sure that the, um, that the, the ring fencing of the living wage in care is going uh, to be maintained and going to be delivered. But all, all, these may be welcome programmes, but they don't change the reality that councils previously had more money to deliver on their core responsibilities than they do now in real time. I, I wanted to, to comment directly on, on, on the question, but I just make the point that in considering the impact on individual households and, for that matter, individual businesses, um, I would encourage Parliament to look at your know, households will regard their net income as a single till. So whether the money comes out via income tax, national insurance, council tax, VAT or whatever, people will at the end of the day look at how much money is left to spend and that is the impact on, on, on the wider economy But you should bear in mind. So to, to some extent, whether you take the money through income tax or the council takes it through council tax for those who are affected, it's the bottom line that people will be more concerned about rather than where, how it is taken. Okay. Okay. Um Emma, I think you wanted to concentrate on the impact on the budget, and particularly on women. Am I yeah. Right? Okay. Thank you, Thank you convener. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, I had a sim similar question to the, the last um, panel. It, I'm interested in the impact of the budget, as it seems to be more favourable towards women. Women are more carers. There are more nurses that are women. Um, a lot of those nurses are in a salary band. That means that they will benefit, so they'll have tax. Um, relief. So when we're looking at nurses, carers, those for childcare and providing the care at home for disabled people, the information I have is, seems to be that, you know, women will benefit. Although, Russell Gunson, you said that um, uh, why the income tax is being cut, it's actually not going to benefit the poorest people. So what would be your suggestion for fixing that? So, yeah, for... Um you're right to highlight uh, the gender aspects, I think, in terms of uh, the spend. I'm conscious that we're an all-male panel here talking about gender, so uh, I'll watch my step a little bit on it. But um, the tax cut point uh, that you mentioned, so yes, there are more women 
individuals that are lower earners and mm -hmm. therefore as individuals may benefit more from uh, the tax cut element of the tax changes. Um, however, there's an opportunity cost because that tax cut costs um, X amount per year. What could be done to help women in this case, uh, poor households, by using that money in a different way? So the carers allowance um, top up, I think, is a really interesting way of using funding from the Scottish Government to help carers and predominantly women and other groups. We could look to that uh, and use that same logic in a different way. So topping up benefits may be a much better way to use that money um, to help the poorest households and to help women. Okay. Nobody else want to comment on that? No. Nope. No, well, I've just been flat and wait. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, I mean, from our perspective, and we haven't done the work on it yet. Um, but I think the some of the uh, uh, ticket items that you outline would probably have some um, beneficial effect for those in uh, for those in employment, um, as Russell says. Um, women tend to predominate in, in, in lower income. However, um, if we return to public sector pay, I mean, the first thing to say is it, this budget doesn't pr uh, propose a real terms public sector pay rise for anybody. It provides a real terms public se sector pay cut for everybody. It's just a question of um, what proportion um, that is. Um, and we'd be con particularly concerned, returning to the local government issue, we'd be particularly concerned if the local government settlement constrained uh, the ability of um, local authorities to offer a decent pay rise because we know that in particular um, women are carers and women make up a large part of the, um, of the lower... Um, uh, lower salaried staff within uh, local government. Our other concern would be that any cuts in services more generally tend to impact upon women worse. Um, and again, we would make the case that a larger tax quantum, which would allow redistribution of services, not just to those in employment, but Russell's paper points to the 40% of people who, who aren't in employment, um, that a more ambitious redistributive um, act Act, um, program in respect of that, which have a more fundamentally um, rebalancing effect for women than, than what's currently proposed. Can I just ask a wee so? Yep, when you go. Um, so, have you done an analysis on how the Scottish Government's draft budget compares to Westminster's budget when it compares to how does it benefit women and people who are disabled who are in work as well? We haven't done that analysis. However, you can be clear that there are. Um, tax cuts on the income side, income tax cuts, should I say, um, proposed down south, um, because the rates are staying the same and the higher rate threshold is going up um, uh, with inflation, so in cash terms. Um, and equally, there's steeper spending cuts. And as Dave says, um, services, particularly those for the poorest, are much more likely to help women um, than men. And lastly, of course, um, the benefits cuts that we're seeing at the UK level are disproportionately likely to affect women rather than men. Um, so we haven't done the analysis, but you can see which way it's likely to point. Okay. Likewise, we have got the analysis saying so have some figures from Institute of Charter Council of Scotland that were saying on on salaries um, of earnings below twenty four thousand people taking into account Scottish both draft Scottish budget and the draft UK budget, people would be, would be ninety pounds a year more in their pocket. It's a very modest amount, but it's still on the positive side of those pay bans. Um, I suppose the real question is, is with the structure that's being proposed in this draft budget, and depending where people are on, on, on the uh, on the starter, the basic and intermediate banding, is how that triggers other benefits. You know, currently, it, it's the basic rate for this, the, the, the trigger point for a number of benefits, positive or negatively. Does that stay the same? How, does that, how do you work that through north of the border when benefits remain? in the UK system that way. And equally, the calculation of, for those who are paying pensions, you know, auto enrolment now is, is there for everybody. Um, and equally, for third sector, the impact on gift aid, for example, of, of the new banding is something we haven't really figured out yet, but our questions that come through as you put a new structure in place, how does that flow through and, uh, and the consequentials? Okay, thanks. Um, Patrick, I think you've got a question related to that and also about pay as well, haven't you? I, I just wanted to follow up briefly on the, the tax points that have been made and then and then come back to, to pay. There's been, I think it's fair to say, a, a, a lukewarm or, or less than lukewarm response from a couple of witnesses to the, to the reduction uh, uh, in income tax for the introduction of the starter rate. Can I suggest that there's a couple of reasons why we shouldn't be too 
bothered about that, partly uh, that on targeting there is no income tax change that we can make in Scotland that would benefit the very lowest income households because they don't pay income tax at all. And this is probably a better targeting than what was previously uh, expected, the, the idea of uh, introducing an extra zero band, uh, effectively increasing the, the personal allowance. That would be far less well targeted than this uh, because the bulk of it would go the bulk of that tax cut would go to, to higher income individuals and households. And secondly, just on quantum, the, the effect of it is two million a year, three million a year. It's really very modest, and we should be much more focused uh, on what's happening at the at the top three rates uh, in terms of their, their their much greater ability to affect the scale of the Scottish budget. In terms of the quantum of it, we haven't done the analysis. I'm not um clear on that. I think that's quoting the Scottish Fiscal Commission, isn't it? Um, this is Table A6 from the Fiscal Commission. I wasn't report. sure, personally, um, maybe you got that in the earlier session, whether that is just the effect. Um, I think it's on the the folk that are, so it's, it's categorised by your top rate of tax that you pay. So I'm not sure that that is the quantum for the overall cost of cutting tax. Um, there will be, I'll, I'll work, I can come back to the committee in more detail on that. It's hard to put it verbally. But regardless, um, if there are opportunity costs, um, if there are better ways of targeting even a few million pounds, then we should look to them, particularly when, as we've just been discussing, budgets are tight. Um, and, but you are correct to say that an even worse, uh, you know, a less well-targeted uh, proposal would be a zero rate or a personal mm. allowance increase. Okay. Um, uh, sorry, did you want to... Uh, similarly, on the figure, um, I, um, I would be surprised if... This, that wasn't just a figure for those um, uh, who are earning that sum of money rather than the overall ripple effects within the whole system. And a 1p tax cut for all income over, um, is it £19,000, um, modelled right through the income scale is bound to be is, is, is bound to be a lot more than a couple of um, million pounds. So we really just, I think that must be about the impact on those people in particular rather than the, the overall quantum. Of, of course, yeah. people, you know, just enter the intermediate rate. That would uh, that yeah. saving lower down in their yeah. the, the wage scale would would be counterbalanced by the the 21p rate. Um, moving on to to uh, sorry, Good to I just I was just going to say actually on on that point back to the point I made earlier on that um, you know you you can give it for left hand and take away for right if you if you give an income tax cut but then bump up council tax for those who pay council tax then it's counterbalanced. It's a fair point. Um, the structure. I think you could bear in mind, we've heard a lot about uh, in recent years about simplification of various systems, tax simplification. So this, the new structure does fly in the face of that. Um, and that's where, uh, in my introductory remarks, I mentioned the issue of hidden costs and, and perception issues, that standing the objectives we're trying to achieve in terms of fair settlement and inclusive settlement, um, I think we just need to be careful about how we overcomplicate things by bringing in multiple bans and equally, on the targeting issue, if my if I can, uh, figures I have from ICAS is that for those who earn um, under 44,000, there's 2.1 million people in Scotland. For those who earn more than 44,000, it's uh, it's 350,000 people. So there's a, there's a far smaller pool of people. And equally, I think we've said it's been shown previously in tax systems that if if you target the top end, you you create more of an incentive for people to take steps to avoid paying that um, higher rate taxes. Again, is a, a balancing act to be struck here. Yeah, we, we've certainly discussed the degree of uncertainty there is around those those potential <laughs> behavioural effects. Can I move on to, to pay? But on that, just before we move that, yep. Neil, if that was the case, if we went to have this standard situation across the whole UK, as you suggested, what would be the point in changing any policies as well? Because that would be exactly the same, and that would leave us the the, the fundamental question: What's the point in the Scottish Parliament? <laughs> yeah, um, no, I, I think the point which I say is like. It, Let's give, let's, give, let's give an example. If you've got a, um, we know that we, we, are, we have a shortage of a number of key skills going forward. Let's, someone who works in digital. They've got the opportunity of, of doing a, a cyber security job comes up in Glasgow, one comes up in Newcastle or Leeds or somewhere like that. It's a relatively well paid job. Let's say that person's pick a number, earning 60,000, 100,000. Current draft settlement, draft budget, makes a relatively modest difference to that individual. They'll be paying 60,000, 
£750 worse off in Scotland, at £1,000 worse off on the current 1% band. But if you're that individual thinking, oh, hang on a minute, there's a new structure come in here. It's 1% this year. What's to say it's not 5% in two or three years' time? So in accepting that job, that person's going to be going, right, I'm, I'm, I'm going to stick out for another 10 grand just to make sure I'm not out of pocket in this. And the employer's going to say, no chum, that's my budget. You're not getting it. The net result of that is we are not going to have that individual recruited. We're, going to, we're simply going to reinforce our skill shortage unless we can grow our own in the meantime, which in the short term, at least, we patently are not doing. So these, pe these same people don't look at the fact that they've probably got some young kids that are going to university and they're going to go to US university what with I'm, no tuition you, fees. No, what, what I'm saying is that, is that this, is, this is part of a perception <laughs> issue. And is, if the perception is that Scotland, and it already is in our legal system, it is different. If you are a business looking to relocate in Scotland or to, or to expand in Scotland, we know that our property transaction tax costs, property transaction costs are significantly more than they are just across the border. The current proposal is not enough. No, no one's going to move house, rush to buy a house in Carlisle on the back of this, this draft budget or draft structure. But, but over the piece, we create a perception that it's more, it's more difficult, it's more expensive to do business in Scotland. And where do you get, where do you get the evidence for that? Well, I, say, I said earlier on, you know, this, this is an untested system, un, unlike the, the market. Perception. Time. Where's the evidence? We already know that there are... Um, European, staff, European origin staff who are leaving Scotland or staff who are not coming to Scotland, not because of necessarily Brexit as such, but because of the effect of the exchange rate. People will look at, because in the past people would come here to work and they've got a bounce out of their salary here because of the differential exchange rate in the euro. That's now reversed. People are no longer coming to Scotland on that basis. We know that people, however... Of those who are not directly affected think you'll be fine, it's okay, don't worry about it. Those who are affected by Brexit are, to varying degrees, concerned about their future and their family's future. People will look at and, you know, The Chambers of Commerce does a lot of effort in trying to sell Scotland as a positive place to business. We, look at, we sell Scotland in the round as a lifestyle place. The, the benefits of university education, our easy access to the countryside, international connections, our cultural offering and all of that. But... We also need to be careful that we look at people get a, a balanced view. Okay, I better let others reflect on that. Just really briefly, I mean, we, um, we seem to be focusing there on Europe. Um, I, I argue there's some other risks in terms of a, a European uh, people coming to Scotland, um, which, are, which are greater than that. Most of these people come from uh, countries where they have a higher uh, general level of taxation, um, where that has been linked over a period of time uh, to what I would argue is a more kind of socialised model where in business and um, university education um, and, and the range of other things that make up a society are, are better interlinked. Now, all of the evidence that does exist shows that people undertake a, a, a range of considerations uh, before they decide whether to move somewhere or not. I mean, it's been argued that at, the, at this margin, that's not going to happen. I would argue that at a considerably greater margin, that's still not going to be the major reason that people um, are, are going to use. They're looking at quality of education, they're looking at quality of life, they're looking at social infrastructure. Um, so, you know, this is kind of extreme lack of curve economics, and I think um, it's not, uh, not where we need to be just now. Yeah, no, <laughs> we've been there already. <laughs> Russell, I'll let you make a comment before I come back to Patrick's perfect Just feet. very briefly, um, it's unlikely in our view that at this level of uh, tax rise, particularly as the personal allowance has been going up, particularly as you've seen income tax changes over the previous um, eight, nine years, it's very unlikely to lead to behavioural change uh, of, uh, of what we've uh, seen as a risk in terms of increasing taxes for higher earners. The only caveat I would say is that if we come back to this every single year, and if uncertainty to begins to creep in as to what our tax arrangements are likely to be in three or five years' time. That's something to keep an eye on, I think, but not through this decision. And so longer-term decision-making around tax, certainty is probably a good thing, even if that certainty is around increasing taxes. And to that, just to be clear, I'm not saying the current draft proposal is enough to put anybody off doing anything. It's, it's very marginal numbers at, at best of this current proposal. But I entirely agree with Russell's point. It, it's the if this the genie is out the bottle, this is setting out a new structure. It's how that structure evolves over time that may create the effect. And to answer Dave's point, um, you know, our biggest trading partner is the rest of the UK. It's also our biggest 
source uh, of talent is the rest of the UK. So we're not just talking people coming from abroad, we're talking people coming up from south of the border as well, or considering coming up from south of the border as well. Yes, I, 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 put this, I put the questions off track a bit because I was getting a bit frustrated there. But Patrick, please, and we'll need to, and because I've done that, we'll need to move on a bit quicker. So forgive me. Yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot in there I'd like to respond to, but we are, we, we are short of time. We haven't talked about pay, uh, and I'm, I'm keen that we, that we talk about that uh, to some extent. Now, Dave Moxham has um, very clearly criticised what was published alongside the, the budget in the, in the pay settlement, uh, that the, the pay policy, um, saying that it's clearly below inflation for all public sector workers. Now, Notwithstanding, there's a separate debate about whether the rest of the public sector, including local government, also needs to be funded to, to meet uh, something similar. Um, the Scottish government has clearly gone further than the UK government in trying to move away from a pay freeze and, and try to provide something uh, more than the UK government has. Uh, if we were to try and achieve all of what's in the STUC's paper, so we're talking uh, not just about current inflation, but projected future inflation. The CPI, that might be trying to get to 3.2, 3.4, uh, or moving to RPI, uh, which again is higher, uh, or ensuring that everybody in the public sector gets the same rather than a different uh, settlement, a different offer uh, above or below a certain uh, salary level. Each of those would be another big step for the, the Scottish Government to make. Uh, can you place an order of priorities on those kind of arguments? Are you more concerned that we take account of future inflation or, or RP, RPI? Are you less concerned about the, uh, the equalities issues in terms of making sure that lower earners get a, a decent pay increase? Where do the priorities lie? Right, I'm going to do this without trying to step on the toes of my various uh, affiliated unions who all have their <laughs> bargaining units, and those bargaining units are with specific um, employers, and obviously yeah. there's a range of interests of uh, within that, uh, which I think need to be respected because they're um, autonomous. Um, what I can say, if you like, on, on your last point, is that public sector unions have habitually made uh, pay claims that include waiting for lower paid workers. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not going to comment specifically of if, if, if whether the government's 2 and 3% uh, position uh, um, uh, uh, is exactly the way that we would want to meet that. Although obviously, we'd like it to be 3 and 4, if, even if it were. But there's clearly evidence in, in, in terms of public um, service unions that um, an element of waiting for, for, um, for low paid uh, people is uh, is important. I mean, what I would say is this, and you, you said the Scottish government has made an additional commitment. Now, what that additional commitment is, um, in, in quantum terms, we've yet really to see. So, um, obviously, our argument is that account hasn't been taken of that for local government. We know mm -hmm. that um, local government down south has just made an offer of two percent. Um, in consecutive years to local government unions. So that 2% and 2% isn't substantially different than the 2 and 3%, except Mr Mackay doesn't seem to be funding that for local government, which, as you know, is a large co cohort. The biggest cohort of all is, is obviously health workers, and, 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 and the 2 and 3% uh, um, isn't an offer from, from Derek Mackay, but it seems to be that he would, um, he would fund that if, um, if the pay review body at uh, UK level comes up short. Um, um, but we're not sure that the pay review body at a UK level will necessarily come up short to that figure. It's it's, and, of course, Mr Mackay will get the consequentials for that when that, that is done. So were it the case, for instance, that a similar deal um, was agreed at a UK level than the one Mr Mackay announced in his budget, then that large cohort of workers wouldn't even be um, getting any additional funding. So we've now taken out, if you like, the two largest cohorts of public service workers. His di directly supported staff and those working in NDPs, one would expect, obviously, are covered by the pay policy. Um, but a number of those NDPs haven't received additional funding um, that would be consummate with matching that. Sorry, a rather long way round of saying we haven't yet been able to quantify what the difference in this commitment really is um, from, what, um, um, you know, from what's happening at a UK level. Um, and therefore, as the budget develops, um, we'll be arguing that, um, that Mr Bacay needs to make additional commitment such that all public service workers receive RPI plus um, and that if, if there's any element of waiting that's within that context. 
but you're not able to quantify yet what that would involve. Well, we know we, we, we know that RPA inflation is predicted to run at I think 3.6 percent. Someone will correct me if um, if I'm if I'm wrong there. Um, and we know that there are pay claims in from all the um, uh, cohorts of workers who've currently made a claim that exceed that. There's other ones still to come. We haven't had the local government negotiation yet, and, and the next year's teachers um, uh, negotiation is outstanding too. Um, so we don't know. What we do know is 3.6 is RPI inflation, and what we do know is that every public service union so far has put in a claim above that. Okay. Anybody else? I mean, just to say, so the new powers um, since the 2016 Scotland Act, and you can see it in the Scottish Professional Commission's um, projections for the economy, public sector pay now brings an income side, not just the spend side. So um, there are projections within the Fiscal Commission for public sector pay that begins to drive tax revenue per head which um, comes back into the budget. So this isn't a, a, a zero-sum game in the sense that um, increasing public sector pay may well increase tax revenue, which may well come back in to some extent to offset that cost. So we've done a bit of work on that in the past. Um, but having said that, it would increase cost pressures, which would, um, uh, you know, I'm sure we'd both agree, um, need to be found from somewhere, either through additional ca uh, tax or through cuts from elsewhere. And, and very similar view, actually. The you know, additional pay to public sector workers means they've more in their pocket, more to spend. It's better for the wider economy as well as all the social justice aspects that come along with that as well. Um, the one concern, obviously, would be that, um, how, one, how is that funded? And two, the comparisons um, on the cost side for business in terms of pressures on, on private sector pay would maybe follow through from that. But the sort of rises you're talking about um, are more about keeping pace with the cost of living rather than anything else. And uh, all I'd say is just, it's, it's a question of how you fund it. Thank you. OK. Adam, you've got a supplement? Yeah, thank you. Um, so, you know, we, I think we've lost sight a little bit in this conversation of the con context within which this conversation needs to take place, which is a context of, you know, historically subdued growth, subdued being a very polite term. Um, and, uh, and we've heard a lot of evidence from the Scottish Fiscal Commission earlier today that, that one of the principal drivers of that subdued growth was very poor productivity. So we need to tie in this conversation about pay with that context, with that essential context within which this budget must be understood. So let me ask you the question of whether increasing pay in the public sector without any improvement in outputs is, not, is, is simply going to contribute to even more quickly declining productivity, which is going to make things even worse. We have clear and developing skill shortages um, in the public sector that are now being recognised um, by most people. Um, reducing the quality of work, which you do reduce, um, if you reduce pay, and particularly if you can't fill vacancies, is intensely unproductive. Losing the public service framework, which is provided for business um, in terms of um, uh, city infrastructure, in terms of support services, is very bad for business too. Um, there isn't a particular problem of productivity in the public sector. What we have got is a problem of productivity more generally, um, and that productivity problem is, is based on the creation of, of poor jobs, frankly, um, poor and insecure jobs in the wrong sectors um, of the economy. Now, there's a limited amount of things that the Scottish Government can do about that in the private sector, and we've, broadly speaking, applauded, with, with the exception of some of the, uh, we, we think, badly targeted business rate activity, are broadly to be, um, are broadly to be applauded, but, you know, at the end of the day, we're partly stuck in a, in a position, the Scottish Government's partly stuck in a position not of its own making, because it's about UK government policy, year-on-year um, year UK government policy that hasn't helped productivity, that has <laughs> fetishised about getting very, very low levels of unemployment, but not really concerned itself about the quality of that employment. And by common consent, that is one of the big problems, uh, the biggest problem with, with, with productivity growth in, across the UK. And absolutely. So this productivity problem is not a public sector just productivity problem. And actually, more importantly, it's the productivity problem that exists in parts of the private sector that we need to crack. So there's a big long tail um, of companies across the UK that sit in retail, that sit in hospitality, that sit in care, 
that are much lower in productivity terms than our equivalents uh, outside of the UK. And that's where big amounts of that productivity gap rests. So I absolutely agree that um, a huge... So firstly, the economic context that this budget is taking place is bleak, and it's bleak across the UK and a little bleaker in Scotland. Um, but the, the way out of that is productivity, as the Scottish Fiscal Commission would suggest. And whilst the Scottish Parliament's powers are limited on that, and um, there's a lot more the UK government could be doing on that, in our view, within the context of the powers, um, the places to look would be around, for example, the National Investment Bank, which I think we can welcome, and the capitalisation of it is really welcome and interesting. The more general the capital and infrastructure investment, I think, is, again, um, positive. But within the resource spending, looking at, for example, the £2.5 billion that goes out on skills, colleges, universities, and, with, and testing that a bit more tightly against productivity improvements, against inclusive growth, against narrowing inequalities, I think would be a really interesting and useful exercise, potentially for the new strategic mm -hmm. uh, board of skills and enterprise. So productivity absolutely has to be the priority, particularly in the private sector, in those parts I've mentioned. And whilst a lot of the powers rest in the UK, within the Scottish uh, context, there's some good things to welcome, but we can push it, I think, a bit further in parts of the spending department. Yep. Yeah. I think you're right to raise the challenging, fragile, pick your adjective, state of the economy and the prospects for the economy. Um, I think we too would welcome the uh, and look forward to uh, the budget and look forward to seeing the outcome of the new Enterprise and Skills Board and its budget. We'd also welcome um, the proposed spend on, on broadband, National Investment Bank, the National in uh, Manufacturing Institute and um, the, the money being allocated for, for research and development. Um, Productivity is a challenge across both public and private sectors. Um, but I would say, that, as I've said earlier on, they, I think the concern is when there are significant difficulties, and you touched upon retail earlier on, Russell, um, with um, revenue, with cash flow and pro profitability, and therefore um, business sustainability of, of the retail. And also, we, in other contexts, we talk a lot about you know, the, the, the challenges and the demise of the high street. Um, we need to be very careful about, uh, about where we where you place your bets on this one. And standing the concerns about um, the contribution and the inclusive and, and the organic nature of the economy, as I mentioned earlier on, and the concerns of for, for, for public sector um, staff and public sector budgets, the concern is um, in, in paying for that and funding that, how, how is it funded and, and where, where in the private sector does the burden fall on that, and is it therefore is it affordable? I know Adam's got going to want to talk about skills and training, but James, you still had a supplementary to Patrick's point, so I don't want to lose just, that. Yeah, sure. <laughs> just uh, briefly, just a direct question to Dave Moxham. Um, you've you've criticised the level of settlement to local councils. Um, you've expressed concern that the the pay settlement announced by the cabinet secretary was not. A, an adequate level of funding in the budget to cover that, and you've articulated a view that you would like to see the, the level of pay settlement be greater than that. As the, pallet, as the budget progresses through the Parliament, what are the scale of the financial changes that you think are going to be required to the budget uh, in order to address the concerns that you've outlined? Um, I haven't uh, exactly quantified that, but I'm going to throw a figure in anyway. Why not? Um, I, I would. The SGUC was clear that the Scottish government's tax changes um, should be in the region of twice or three times as ambitious as the most ambitious quantum that they proposed in their tax paper. So I'm going to say. Um, significantly over £500 million pounds, um, should be found. Um, the large proportion of that needs to be uh, um, uh, invested in, in local government, which would also um, cover an impatient level pay claim, um, but it would also be usable for investment in other public services. Too. Okay. I, Adam, I think you wanted to say something about yeah, skills. Um, thank you, uh, convener. Um, and we are jumping around from topic to topic a bit. It's probably my fault, sorry. Um, to, to, just to go back to the, 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 the point um, that a number of you raised in response to my question a few minutes ago about growth and productivity. Uh, you know, what, what, surely one of the key 
infrastructure investments that we need to make as infrastructure in skills and training. We've heard a lot um, today from a variety of, uh, of our witnesses, including from, from, from Neil, about how um, there are pressures on recruitment and skills. So what is your reflection on the fact that this budget proposes to keep the skills and training budget just flatlined at £232 million, pounds, which is exactly the same as it was last year. No additional investment, notwithstanding the pressures that we hear um, post-Brexit, um, notwithstanding the pressures that we hear with regard to productivity, no additional investment at all in skills and training in this budget. Is that, um, is that the right judgment in your view? And if it isn't the right judgment in your, view, in your view, what other line of the budget should be cut to increase the spending in skills and training? We've done a great deal of work on, on the skills system over the last year or so, and particularly how it links to improving our economy and productivity as part of that. Um, so it's real terms protection, so you're right to say in real terms it's not going up. Across colleges, skills and universities it is, but the pressures um, that we've heard in terms of public sector pay and others uh, exist as much in those sectors as elsewhere. And there are potentially spending commitments from policy commitments, for example, the independent student support review that I sat on, chaired by Jane and Gadia, that's there too. Um, where should, should it be higher? Of course, you know, looking at the, the challenges we're facing, whether they be from UK-wide Brexit um, and potentially immigration changes that follow, and never mind that follow, we're already seeing an impact on immigration levels uh, as things stand. Um, secondly, this shouldn't be, and this may be music to your ears, I'm not sure, but this shouldn't be a public sector problem only. So yes, public investment in skills is very important, but business investment in skills is equally, if not more so. And what we've been seeing in recent years in Scotland and across the UK, due to no doubt a deteriorating economy and confidence, is a reduction in business investment in skills. Secondly, the pattern of that investment isn't what you would like if you want to achieve inclusive growth and if you want to achieve a growth in low productivity areas. In that, you're much more likely to receive an investment from your employer in your skills if you're high skilled than you are if you're low skilled. So there are things we need to look at in the pattern of employer investment in skills that will help. And then lastly, just on this point, it's not just increasing skill levels. So Scotland has the highest level of qualifications in the whole of the UK um, in terms of uh, HNC level or above. Um, it's utilisation of those skills that's really important too. And again, that can't be done from here in Holyrood. It can't be done from St Andrew's House. It has to be done in partnership with employers. So how do we get employers better utilising the skills that we have already as much as improving skills too? I mean, I'd associate myself with, with everything I think that Russell said, Devon, so I'll not um, repeat it. Um, uh, you asked where money should come from. I think looking at support for business and tying support for business more um, directly and organically to action taking on skills, provision of quality employment is where we need to go. It's why, for instance, and sorry to repeat myself, we think that um, if money is going to be provided to small business, it should be provided to small business on the basis of what they're going to create and how they're going to boost the economy rather than just as a flat um, a flat rebate. Being frank, some of that will be usefully used, some of it will be, will, will be funding second cars for people. Um, you know, um, so let's look at big lumps of money like that £200 million. Pounds. Let's look at the fact that that more or less equals the budget that you just uh, spoke about and see how budgets like those can work together so that we get, we get additional investment in, um, in the strategic areas of skills development, research and, and development that can see our economy prosper uh, into the future. In terms, we're all in agreement. Um, you know, it's something the Chambers Network has said consistently for several years now is a concern about skills issues, a concern about, about recruitment and retention. Um, the Chambers Network is heavily involved in the Developing Young Workforce Programme and Business to Business Mentoring. Um, we have a thousand mentoring opportunities up and running already. One specific thing I would flag is the fate of the apprenticeship levy. Um, across the UK, if you're down south, um, you pay the apprenticeship levy, then you can claim that back by, by your training spend. Up here it goes uh, to the college sector, which in itself is a policy decision. It's not necessarily bad, but it does create some perverse incentives. For example, larger companies are sending people down south uh, for, for training programmes, things which seems a bit nuts. Let's keep the skills in Scotland. Let's let, let's grow the economy in Scotland. Um, but more power to elbow now. Thank you. 
Ash, you know, supplementary in this area around skills, etc. But was it related to the labour market or the National Investment Bank? In the National Investment Bank. Yes, thanks, convener. Um, good afternoon. It is now, I think. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to pick up on a couple of points from the IPR um, paper, and you mentioned it again just now um, because you noted that capitalisation of the National Investment Bank was, and you said, welcome and interesting. So in the paper, you said that it's 5% of the capital budget over two years, which is quite a high level, um, and that also in the future it will include financial transactions, which strikes me that might be quite a good use of financial transactions money compared to perhaps what the UK government is using it for to do with the housing market down south. And you said it could boost levels of investment and productivity. Could you expand on that a little? Yes, yeah, so the National Investment Bank is something we've called for across the UK for a, a long time. Um, they exist in lots of other countries and do good jobs in lots of other countries mm. too. So I think it's really welcome that the, the Scottish Government have set up the Scotland National Investment Bank and the capitalisation over, I think, from not this year, but in the next year onwards for two years is really welcome. The reason for that is almost related to what we were talking about just at the last question around business investment and skills. Um, the more that we can use public funding to gear in or crowd in uh, funding from outside of the public sector, the better. And partnership between public funding and business, in this case, or employer funding, is always going to um, maximise the impact you can get from that funding. And in Scotland, there's a, just like in the UK, a real gap in terms of business investment, whether that be in R&D, whether that be in infrastructure, whether that be more generally including in skills. So this is a really interesting, I think, um, innovation in the sense that it could begin to change employer behaviour, gear in employer investment, and as long as it's focused on the long term, which too little of the investment at the UK level is in our view, you can begin to see some of those long term benefits around productivity growth, um, etc. On the financial transactions, I would absolutely agree. So the way they're being used at the UK level is predominantly in housing, help to buy included. We've used some of that in Scotland um, in the past for that. Um, a much uh, sort of greater impact for that funding could be investing in some of the things that we talked about that will boost productivity. Yeah. Investing in help to buy um, is very unlikely to, or uh, not likely to have large impacts on productivity. Yeah. Investing in some of this long-term patient capital style investment is much more likely to do it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Listen, I'm, I just, I'm conscious of the fact that the Chamber starts at quarter past one. Just to remember members today, because members' business starts at quarter past one. So we've, got, we've still got a report to complete in private after the session. So I'm afraid we're going to have to speed on a bit. And in saying that, Murdo. <laughs> I don't know what you're implying, uh, Convener. I'm implying um, that I know your questions are going to be short. Uh, my questions are going to be very short, Convener. Um, just f f one question to Russell Gunson on the IPPPR report. Um, going back to this question of taxes, there's a, a statement in your report, I'll just quote to you, it says this, improving the performance of Scotland's economy and more particularly tax revenue per head in Scotland relative to the rest of the UK will be crucial to ending public spending cuts in Scotland in future years. Now, um, I don't know if you caught the evidence we got from the Fiscal Commission earlier, or you've probably seen their, their uh, written report, but clearly their projections are for much slower um, economic growth in Scotland over the next four years. So what, in your view, does that mean for the trajectory of uh, tax rates in Scotland um, between now and 2021? So firstly, in terms of the tax changes that um, have been announced, so it's uh, important to get the context or the, uh, the, the scale of them um, in perspective. So it's around 0.1% of GDP. So we're not talking um, huge tax rises at this point, but they are welcome, as we said, because in our view, they're necessary. Um, beyond that, what are, uh, we know the allocations to the Scottish Parliament for next year. Um, we know the block grant adjustment and we know tax revenue projections from the Fiscal Commission. And with that, we're likely to see deep cuts as things stand restarting again. Um, so around £250 million in real terms across all spending on the resource side, £350 million for non-protected. So that's about 3%. Um, so significant. And the IFS project beyond that, um, deeper cuts at the UK level, which will impact on our budget. So something we'll have to give, it will either be um, cuts restarting, it will either be additional spending through a change in policy at the UK level compared to what is currently planned, or it will have to be um, further tax rises of some sort, whether on income tax or others, in Scotland. 
So that's the, the, you know, looking ahead beyond this year, really. That's the prognosis. The key to it, though, again, it, it links to Ash's question just a minute ago. Improving the economy, strengthening tax revenue per head would allow us to escape cuts in future years without having to increase tax, uh, just in essence to run, to stand still. Okay, and just as a, a very brief follow-up to that, if, if the economy grows in line with the Fiscal Commission projections, have you any figure as to what level of tax increases you would therefore need to fill the gap you're talking about? So just for next year, so um, the tax rises uh, or the tax, the net effect of the tax changes, should I say, um, for this year are around 164 million. Um, as I say, uh, cuts across the whole of the, the budget next year are around 250 million, so higher than the revenue raised through the tax changes proposed this year. You mean next year, the following financial Sorry, year? Sorry, 2019-20, yeah. yeah. I should yeah. say. Yeah. Um, so for 2019-20, 250, 250 million across all um, spending on the resource side, to compare that to the tax changes proposed for 2018-19, uh, that's 164. So you'd have to do more than what okay. has been done this year. OK, and thank you. And if I can just put that point then to Neil Amner, given what you've already told us about your members' view on tax rates, if that were to follow through, presumably you would be concerned about that. Yes. Um, if you're short of time, uh, yes. <laughs> and back to the earlier point about the investment bank, yes, we need to grow the economy so we thank don't have that gap. Thank you. Thank you. Dave, you want to put another in before I move on? No, I think Russell summed it up well, and I obviously uh, disagree right. with um, you. Ivan? I'm fine. You're Should fine. Covered, yeah. Alexander? Very quick question. Thank you, convener. Can I note my register of interest around businesses and being an employer? Um, it's obviously disappointing to hear uh, a lot of the blame being put on businesses for uh, productivity uh, in face of the burdens and costs being imposed on it. Um, in reference to one particular cost, and very briefly, um, yeah, HMRC, when they were here, uh, describe the additional rates being uh, created as costing them an extra up to five million pounds uh, in administering. Uh, I wonder, is there any assessment done on how much uh, these additional rates uh, come as a cost to businesses uh, in regards to payroll, software, that kind of aspect? I haven't got figures for it. Uh, the National Audit Office, I think, uh, talked about uh, effectively treble the cost of administering the tax system when you put multiple layers in. Um, I guess it's something along those lines, but if you are uh, an employer who has employees north and south of the border, you effectively have to run double payroll systems. You're going, to, even at an individual level, you're going to spend more time and, con and concern checking and rechecking, and, and actually the, the, the tax system is going to spend time um, going back and refixing and, and, and redoing calculations, and, and not just actually for tax, but also for benefits as well, potentially, because of that, of that uncertainty as to, or confusion, potentially, that we're relying, the, the, the cost of it. Dave. Yeah, um, the um, the staff, um, the cuts to staff in the HMRC and, the, and and future office closures are going to be to the detriment of business and to the public exchequer. Unfortunately, that's not in the hands uh, of the Scottish um, government just now. I mean, on the more general point. Um, <coughs> It isn't our biggest concern, but given our general view that the advantages of a small, very small tax cut for people of, of, of wages at the lower end are moot, it does become significant to us that the, extra, that the extra complications and the extra cost may not be worth it, given that we're not particularly convinced of the benefits. And just very, very briefly. Very, very briefly. Um, I'd say, so not to blame businesses in terms of productivity, it's quite the opposite to say that they're part of the solution alongside government. Um, and secondly, whilst additional rates may increase the burden, sorry, additional bans, um, other countries that have much better productivity than us have uh, similar numbers of tax bans, so they can cope with a higher productivity level than um, than your concerns. Okay, well, thank you very much for a panel for coming along and giving us evidence prior to Christmas. I hope I wish you a good festive break. Uh, I now move this into private session and we'll need to crack on with our report. Thank you very much. <laughs>